Chapter One of Eyebright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Eyebright by Susan Coolidge. Chapter One Lady Jane and Lord Guildford. It wanted but five minutes to twelve in Miss Fitch's schoolroom and a general restlessness showed that her scholars were aware of the fact some of the girls had closed their books and were putting their desks to rights with a good deal of unnecessary fuss keeping an eye on the clock meanwhile the boys wore an air of dogs who see their master coming to untie them they jumped and quivered making the benches squeak and rattle and shifted their feet about on the uncarpeted floor producing sounds of the kind most trying to a nervous teacher a general expectation prevailed luckily miss fitch was not nervous she had that best of all gifts for teaching calmness and she understood her pupils and their ways and had sympathy with them she knew how hard it is for feet with the dance of youth in them to keep still for three long hours on a june morning and there was a pleasant roguish look in her face as she laid her hand on the bell and meeting the twenty-two pairs of expectant eyes which were fixed on hers rang it dear miss fitch actually a minute and a half before the time at the first tinkle little arrows dismissed from the bowstring two girls belonging to the older class jumped from their seats and flew ahead of all the rest into the entry where hung the hats and caps of the school and their dinner baskets one seized a pink sunbonnet from its nail the other a shaker scoop with a deep green cape each possessed herself of a small tin pail and just as the little crowd swarmed into the passage they hurried out on the green in the middle of which the schoolhouse stood it was a very small green shaped like a triangle with half a dozen trees growing upon it but little things are great to little men you know and to miss fitch's little men and women the green had all the importance and excitement of a park each one of the trees which stood upon it possessed a name of its own every crotch and branch in them was known to the boys and the most daring among the girls each had been the scene of games and adventures without number the castle a low spreading oak with wide horizontal branches had been the favorite tree for fights half the boys would garrison the boughs the other half scrambling from below and clutching and tugging would take the part of besiegers and it had been great fun all round but alas for that had been ever since one unlucky day when luther bradley as king charles had been captured five bows up by cromwell and his soldiers and his ankle badly sprained in the process miss fitch had ruled that the castle should be used for fighting purposes no longer the boys might climb it but they must not call themselves a garrison nor pull nor struggle with each other so the poor oak was shorn of its military glories and forced to comfort itself by bearing a larger crop of acorns than had been possible during the stirring and warlike times now for ever ended then there was the dovecot an easily climbed tree on which rows of girls might be seen at noontimes roosting like fowls in the sun and there was the falcon's nest which produced every year a few small sour apples and which isabella bright had adopted for her tree she knew every inch of the way to the top to climb it was like going up a well-known staircase and the sensation of sitting there aloft high in air on a bough which curved and swung with another bough exactly fitting her back to lean against was full of delight and fascination it was like moving and being at rest all at once like flying like escape the wind seemed to smell differently and more sweetly up there than in lower places two or three times lost in fancies as deep as sleep isabella had forgotten all about recess and bell and remained on her perch swinging and dreaming till someone was sent to tell her that the arithmetic class had begun and once direful day marked with everlasting black in the calendar of her conscience 
being possessed suddenly as it were by some idle and tricksy demon she stayed on after she was called and called again still she stayed and when at last miss fitch herself came out and stood beneath the tree and in her pleasant mild voice told her to come down still the naughty girl secure in her fastness stayed and when at last miss fitch growing angry spoke severely and ordered her to descend isabella shook the boughs and sent a shower of hard little apples down on her kind teacher's head that was dreadful indeed and dreadfully did she repent it afterward for she loved miss fitch dearly and except for being under the influence of the demon could never have treated her so miss fitch did not kiss her for a whole month afterward that was isabella's punishment and it was many months before she could speak of the affair without feeling her eyes fill swiftly with tears for isabella's conscience was tender and her feelings very quick in those days this however was eighteen months ago when she was only ten and a half she was nearly twelve now and a good deal taller and wiser i have introduced her as isabella because that was her real name but the children and everybody always called her eyebright i bright it had been written in the report of her first week at miss fitch's school when she was a little thing not more than six years old the droll name struck someone's fancy and from that day she was always called eyebright because of that and because her eyes were bright they were gray eyes large and clear set in a wide low forehead from which a thick mop of hazel brown hair with a wavy kink all through it was combed back and tied behind a brown ribbon her nose turned up a little her mouth was rather wide but it was a smiling good-tempered mouth the cheeks were pink and wholesome and altogether though not particularly pretty eyebright was a pleasant-looking little girl in the eyes of the people who loved her and they were a good many the companion with whom she was walking was bessie mother her most intimate friend just then bessie was the daughter of a portrait painter who didn't have many portraits to paint so he was apt to be discouraged and his family to feel rather poor eyebright was not old enough to perceive the inconveniences of being poor to her there was a great charm in all that goes to the making of pictures she loved the shining paint tubes the palette set with its ring of many colored dots and the white canvases even the smell of oil was pleasant to her and she often wished that her father too had been a painter when as once in a great while happened bessie asked her to tea she went with a sort of awe over her mind and returned in a rapture to tell her mother that they had had biscuits and apple sauce for supper and hadn't done anything in particular but she had enjoyed it so much and it had been so interesting mrs bright never could understand why biscuits and apple sauce which never created any enthusiasm in eyebright at home should be so delightful at bessie mother's neither could eyebright explain it but so it was this portrait painting father was one of bessie's chief attractions in eyebright's eyes but apart from that she was sweet-tempered pliable and affectionate and a strong bond in friendship sometimes she liked to follow and eyebright to lead she preferred to listen and eyebright to talk so they suited each other exactly bessie's hair was dark she was not quite so tall as eyebright but their heights matched very well as with arms round each other's waist they paced up and down the green stopping now and then to take a cookie or a bite of bread and butter from the dinner pails which they had set under one of the trees not the least attention did they pay to the rest of the scholars but eyebright began at once as if reading from some book which had been laid aside only a moment before at that moment lady jane heard a tap at the door see who it is margaret she said margaret opened the door and there stood before her astonished eyes a knight clad in shining armour who are you sir knight and wherefore do you come she cried in amaze i am come to see the lady jane grey he replied i have a message for her from lord guildford dudley 
from my noble guildford shrieked lady jane rushing forward even so madam replied the knight bowing profoundly here eyebright paused for a large bite of bread and butter go on please go on pleaded bessie whose mouth happened to be empty just then mumble mumble the lady jane sank back on her couch resumed eyebright speaking rather thickly by reason of the bread and butter she was very pale and one tear ran slowly down her pearly cheek what says my lord she faintly uttered he bids me to tell you to hope on hope ever cried the knight the jailer's daughter has promised to steal her father's keys to-night unbar his door and let him escape can this be true cried margaret that's you you know bessie be ready to catch me help my lady is about to faint with joy here eyebright sank on the grass while bessie made a dash and raised her head is it can it be true murmured the lady jane her languid hand meanwhile stealing into the dinner pail and producing therefrom a big red apple it is true the blessed news is indeed true cried the true-hearted margaret i feel new life in my veins and the lady jane sprang to her feet here eyebright scrambled to hers come margaret she cried we must decide in what garb we shall meet my dearest lord when he comes from prison don't you think the cram cram cranberry velvet with a network of pearls and what else did they wear bessie girdles ventured bessie and a girdle of gems went on eyebright easily and quite regardless of expense don't you think that will be best girl oh eyebright would she say girl broke in bessie it doesn't sound polite enough for the lady jane they all do i assure you they do i can show you the place in shakespeare it don't sound so nice because when people say girl now it always means servant girl you know but it was different then and lady jane did say my girl and you mustn't interrupt so bessie or we shan't get to the execution this recess and after school i want to play the little princes in the tower i won't interrupt any more said bessie go on yes the cranberry velvet is my choice resumed eyebright sir knight accept my grateful thanks he bent low and kissed her fair hand may naught but good tidings await you evermore he murmured sorrow should never light on so fair a being ah she said sorrow seems my portion what is rank or riches or ducality to a happy heart what did you say what was that word eyebright ducality lady jane's father was a duke you know the knight sighed deeply and withdrew ah guildford murmured the lady jane laying her head on the shoulder of her beloved margaret shall i indeed see you once more it seems too good to be true eyebright paused and bit into her apple with an absorbed expression she was meditating the next scene in her romance so the next day and the next went by and still the lady jane prayed and waited night came at last and now lord guildford might appear at any moment margaret dressed her lovely mistress in the velvet robe twined the pearls in her golden hair and clasped the jewelled girdle round her slender waist one snow-white rose was pinned in her bosom never had she looked so wildly beautiful but still lord guildford came not at last a tap at the door was heard it is he cried the lady jane and flew to meet him but alas it was not he a stern and gigantic form filled the doorway and entering looked at her with fiery eyes no his helmet was shut tight wouldn't that be better bessie oh yes much better do have it shut said the obliging bessie his lineaments were hidden by his helmet resumed eyebright correcting herself but there was something in his aspect which made her heart thrill with terror you are looking to see if i am one who will never cross your path again he said in a harsh tone lady jane gray no guildford dudley has this day expiated his crimes on tower hill his headless trunk is already buried beneath the pavement where traitors lie oh no no in mercy unsay the word 
shrieked the lady jane and with one quick sob she sank lifeless to the earth while margaret sank beside her we won't really sink i think bessie because the grass stains are clothes so and they get so messed up wealthy says she can't imagine what i do to my things there was so much grass green in them that it greened all the water in the tub last wash she told mother that was when we played the coromantic captive you know and i had to keep fainting all the time we'll just make believe we sank i guess rouse yourself lady went on the stern warrior i have more to communicate you are my prisoner here is the warrant to arrest you and the soldiers wait outside one dizzy moment and lady jane rallied the spirit of her race her face was deadly pale but she never looked more lovely i am ready she said with calm dignity only give me time to breathe one prayer and sinking at the foot of her crucifix she breathed an ave maria in such melodious tones that all present refrained from tears lead on she murmured we now pass to the scene of execution proceeded eyebright whose greatest gift as a story-teller was her power of getting over difficult parts of the narrative in a sort of inspired rapid way i guess we won't have any trial bessie because trials are so hard and i don't know exactly how to do them it was a chill morning in early spring the sun had hid its face from the awful spectacle the bell was tolling the crowd assembled and the executioner stood leaning on the handle of his dreadful axe the block was ready oh eyebright it is awful interposed bessie on the point of tears at last the door of the tower opened went on the relentless eyebright and the slender form of the lady jane appeared led by the captain of the guard and followed by a long procession of monks and soldiers her faithful margaret was by her side drowned in tears she was so young so fair and so sweet that all hearts pitied her and when she turned to the priest and said father do not weep eyebright here broke down and began to cry as for bessie she had been sobbing hard with her handkerchief over her eyes for nearly two minutes i am going to heaven faltered eyebright overcome with emotion thank my cousin bloody mary for sending me there can you tell me the way to mr bright's house said a voice just behind them the girls jumped and looked round in the excitement of the execution they had wandered without knowing it to the far edge of the green which bordered on the public road a gentleman on horseback had stopped close beside them and was looking at them with an amused expression which changed to one of pity as the two tear-stained faces met his eye is anything the matter are you in any trouble he asked anxiously oh no sir not a bit we are only playing we are having a splendid time explained eyebright and then anxious to change the subject and also to get back to lady jane and her woes she made haste with the direction for which the stranger had asked just down there sir turn the first street and it's the fourth house from the corner no the fifth which is it bessie let me see replied bessie counting on her fingers mrs claps mr potter's mr wheelwright's it's the fourth eyebright the gentleman thanked them and rode away as he did so the bell tinkled at the schoolhouse door oh there's that old bell i don't believe it's time one bit miss fitch must have set the clock forward declared eyebright alas no miss fitch had done nothing of the sort for at that moment clang went the town clock which as every one knew kept the best of time and by which all the clocks and watches in the neighbourhood were set Phew! it really is cried eyebright how short recess seems not longer than a minute not more than half a minute chimed in bessie oh eyebright it was too lovely i hate to go in the cheeks and eyelids of the almost executed lady jane and her bower maiden were in a sad state of redness when they entered the schoolroom but nobody took any particular notice of them miss fitch was used to such appearances and so were the other boys and girls when eyebright and bessie mother had spent their recess as they almost always did in playing the game which they called acting stories 
End of chapter one. Chapter two of Eyebright by Susan Coolidge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter two. After school. Four o'clock seemed slow in coming but it struck at last as hours always will if we wait long enough and miss fitch dismissed school after a little bit of bible reading and a short prayer people nowadays are trying to do away with bibles and prayers in schools but i think the few words which miss fitch said in the lord's ear every night and they were very few and simple sent the little ones away with a sense of the father's love and nearness which it was good for them to feel all the girls and some of the boys waited to kiss miss fitch for good night it had been a pleasant day nobody for a wonder had received a fault mark of any kind nothing had gone wrong and the children departed with a general bright sense that such days do not often come and that what remained of this ought to be made the most of there were still three hours and a half of precious daylight what should be done with them Eyebright and a knot of girls whose homes lay in the same direction with hers walked slowly along the street together It was a beautiful afternoon with sunshine of that delicious sort which only June knows how to brew Warm but not burning bright but not dazzling It lay over the walk in broad golden patches broken by soft purple blue shadows from the elms which had just put out their light leaves and looked like fountains of green spray tossed high in the air There was a sweet smell of hyacinths and growing grass and cherry blossoms Altogether it was not an afternoon to spend in the house and the children felt the fact I Don't want to go home yet said Molly prime. Let's do something pleasant altogether instead. I Wish my swing were ready and we'd all have a swing in it said Laura wheelwright Tom said he would put it up today But mother begged him not because she said I had a cold and would be sure to run in the damp grass and wet my feet What shall we do we might go for a walk to round pond will you no? I'll tell you burst in Eyebright don't let's do that because if we do the big boys will see us and want to come too and then we shan't have any fun Let's all go into our barn There's lots of hay up in the loft and we'll open the big window and make thrones of hay to sit on and tell stories It could be just as good as outdoors and no one will know where we are or come to interrupt us Don't you think delicious it would be nice do come Laura? Delicious come along girls answered Laura crumpling her soft sunbonnet into a heap and throwing it up into the air as if it had been a ball oh may we come too pleaded little tom and rosy berry no you can't answered their sister kitty sharply you'd be tumbling down and getting frightened and all sorts of things you'd better run right home by yourselves the little ones were silent but they looked anxiously at eyebright i think they might come kitty she said they're almost always good and there's nothing in the loft to hurt them Yes, they can come. Oh, very well. If you want the bother of them, I'm sure I don't mind, replied Kitty. Then they all ran into the barn. The eight pairs of double soled boots clattered on the stairs like a sudden hailstorm on a roof. Little old Charlie and a strange horse who seemed to be visiting them, who were munching their evening hay, raised their heads astonished. While a furtive rustle from some dim corner in the loft showed that Mrs. Topknot, or mrs. Cochin China hidden away there heard too and did not like the sound at all Oh Isn't this lovely cried Kitty Berry kicking the fine hay before her till it rose in clouds Barns are so nice. I think Yes, but don't kick that way said Romaine Smith choking and sneezing. Oh Dear I shall smother I bright please open the window quick. I'm strangling Eyebright who was sneezing too made haste to undo the rusty hook and swing the big wooden shutter back against the outside wall of the barn It made an enormous square opening which seemed to let in all outdoors at once 
dark places grew light the soft pure air glad of the chance flew in to mix with the sweet heavy smell of the dried grasses it was as good as being outdoors as eyebright had said the girls pulled little heaps of hay together for seats and ranged themselves in a half circle round the window with mr bright's orchard pink and white with fruit blossoms underneath them and beyond that between mr berry's house and barn a glimpse of valley and blue river and the long range of wooded hills on the opposite bank it was a charming outlook and though the children could not have put into words what pleased them they all liked it and were the happier for its being there now we're ready who will tell the first story asked molly prime briskly i'll tell the first said eyebright always ready to take the lead it's a splendid story i read it in a book once upon a time long long ago there was a little tailor who was very good and his name was hans he lived all alone in his little house and had to work very hard because he was poor one day as he sat sewing away someone knocked at the door come in said hans and an old old man came in he was wrapped up in a cloak and looked very cold and tired please may i warm myself by your fire he said why of course you may said good little hans a warm at the fire costs nothing and you are welcome so the old man sat down and warmed himself have you come a long way today hans asked yes said the old man a long long way and i'm ever so cold and hungry poor old fellow thought hans i wish i had something for him to eat but i haven't because there is nothing for my own dinner except a piece of bread and a cup of milk but then he thought i can do with a little less for once i'll give the old man half of that so he broke the bread in two and poured half the milk into another cup and gave them to the old man who thanked him and ate it up but he still looked so hungry that hans thought poor fellow he is a great deal older than i i can go without a dinner for once and i'll give him the rest wasn't that good of hans yes very good replied the children beginning to get interested when the old man had eaten up all the bread and milk he looked much better and he got up to go and said you have been very good and given me all your own dinner i wish i had something to give you in return but i have only got this and he took from under his cloak a shabby old coffee mill the shabbiest old thing you ever saw all cut up with jackknives you know and scratched with pins with ink spots on it eyebright drawing on her imagination for shabby particulars was thinking you see of her desk at school which certainly was shabby hans could hardly keep from laughing but the old man said severely don't smile this mill is better than it looks it is a magic mill whenever you want anything you have only to give the handle one turn and say little mill grind so and so open sesame and no matter what it is the mill will begin of itself and grind it for you then when you have enough you must say little mill stop grinding abracadabra and it will stop good-bye and before hans could say a word the old man hurried out of the door and was gone leaving the queer old mill behind him of course hans thought he must be crazy i should have thought so said bessie mother who was cuddled in the hay close to eyebright well he wasn't hans at first thought he would throw the mill away it looked so dirty and horrid but then he thought i might as well try it let me see what do i want most at the moment why my dinner to be sure i gave mine to the old man i'll ask for a goose roast goose with hot buttered rolls and coffee that's a dinner for a prince let alone a tailor like me so he gave the handle a turn and said to the mill little mill grind a fat roast goose open sesame not believing a bit that it would you know and just think all of a sudden the handle began to fly round as fast as the wind and in one second out of the top came a beautiful roast goose all covered with stuffing and gravy 
It came so fast that Hans had to catch hold of its drumsticks and take it in his hand. There wasn't time to fetch a dish. He was so surprised that he stood stock still, staring at the mill with his mouth open. And the handle went on turning, and another goose began to come out of the top. Then Hans was frightened, for he thought, What shall I do with two roast geese at once? And he shouted loudly, Little mill, stop grinding, abracadabra. And the mill stopped, and the other goose, which had only begun to come out, you see, doubled itself up and went back into the inside of the mill as fast as it came. Then Hans fetched a pitcher and said, Little mill, grind hot coffee with cream and sugar, and immediately a stream of coffee came pouring out till the pitcher was full. Then he ground some delicious rolls and butter, and then he set the mill on his shelf and danced about the shop for joy. Hans, he said, your fortune is made. And so it was, because, you know, if people came and asked, How soon could you make me a coat? Hans just had to answer, Why, tomorrow, of course. And then, when they were gone, he would go to the mill and say, Little mill, grind a coat to fit Mr. Jones. And there it would be. The coats all fitted splendidly, and wore twice as long as other coats. And all the town said that Hans was the best tailor that ever was. And they all came to him for things, and he got very rich and took a big shop But he was just as kind to poor people as ever and the mill did everything he wanted wasn't it nice I Wish there really was a mill like that. I know what I would grind said Romaine Well, what would you Romy? a Guitar with a blue ribbon like my cousin Clara Cunningham's she puts the ribbon round her neck and sings and it's just lovely but you don't know how to play do you inquired molly no but afterwards i grind a big music box and just as i began to play no to pretend to play i'd set it off and it would sound as if i was playing pshaw i'd grind something a great deal better than that cried kitty i'd grind a real piano and i'd learn to play it on my own self i wouldn't have any old make-believe music boxes to play for me you never saw a guitar i guess rejoined romaine pouting or you wouldn't think so i'd grind a kitten put in rosie a white one just like my snowdrop snowdrop has run away i don't know where she is how funny she'd look coming out of the coffee mill mewing and purring said eyebright now stop telling what you'd grind and let me go on hans had a neighbor a very bad man whose name was Carl. When he saw how rich Hans was getting to be, he became very enverous. Very what? Enverous. He didn't like it, you know. Don't you mean envious? said Molly Prime. Yes, didn't I say so? Mother says I mispronounce awfully, and that's because I read so much to myself. I meant enver... envious, of course. Well, Carl noticed that every day, when people had gone home to their dinners hans shut his door and stayed alone for an hour and didn't let anybody come in this made him suspect something so one day he bored a little round hole in the back door of hans's house and sat down and put his eye to it and thought here i stay if it is a month till i find out what that little rascal does when he is alone so he watched and watched and for a long time he didn't see anything but hans sewing away and waiting on his customers but at last the clock struck twelve and then hans shut his door and locked it tight and carl said to himself ha ha now i have him hans brought out the coffee mill and set it on the table and carl heard him say little mill grind roast veal open sesame and a nice piece of veal came out of the mill and fell into a platter which hans held to catch it and then carl snapped his fingers and jumped for joy and ran off to the wharf where there was a pirate ship whose captain was a friend of his and he said to the pirate captain our fortunes are made what do you mean asked the pirate i mean said carl 
that that little villain hans the tailor has got a fairy mill which grinds everything he asks for and i know where he keeps it and what he says to make it grind and if you will go shares i'll steal it this very night and we'll sail off to a desert island and there we'll grind gold and grind gold till we are as rich as all the people in the world put together what do you say to that so the pirate captain was delighted of course because you know that's all that pirates want just to get gold and he said yes and that very night when hans was asleep carl crept in stole the mill ran to the wharf and he and the pirate captain sailed away and hans never saw his mill again oh what a shame poor little hans cried the children well it didn't make so much matter explained eyebright comforting them because hans by this time had got to be so well known and people liked him so much that he kept on getting richer and richer and was always kind to the poor and happy so he didn't miss his mill much the pirate ship sailed and sailed and by and by when they were way out at sea the captain said to carl suppose we try the mill and see if it is really as good as you think very well said carl what shall we grind we won't grind any gold yet said the captain because gold is heavy and we can do it better on the desert island we'll just grind some little thing now for fun and he called out to the cook and said hello cook is there anything wanting there in your kitchen yes sir please said the cook we're out of salt we sailed so quick that i couldn't get any so carl fetched the mill and set it on the cabin table and said little mill grind salt open sesame and immediately a stream of beautiful white salt came pouring out till two bags which the cook had brought were quite full and then the captain said that's enough now stop it just at that moment carl recollected that he didn't know how to stop the mill here eyebright made a dramatic pause oh what next what did he do cried the others he said all the words he could think of continued eyebright shut sesame and stop and please stop and don't and ever so many others but he couldn't say the right one because he didn't know it you see so the salt kept pouring on and it filled all the bags and boxes and barrels and and all the salt cellars in the ship and it ran on to the table and it ran on to the floor and the pirate captain caught hold of the handle and tried to keep it from turning and it gave him such a pinch that he put his fingers into his mouth and danced with pain then he was so mad that he got an axe and chopped the mill in two to punish it for knocking him but immediately another handle sprouted out on the half which hadn't any and that made two mills and the salt came faster than ever at last when it was up to their knees carl and the pirate captain ran to the deck to consult what they should do and while they were consulting the mills went on grinding and the ship got so full and the salt was so heavy that all of a sudden down they all sank ship and carl and the pirates and the mills and all to the bottom of the sea eyebright came to a full stop the children drew long breaths did anybody ever get the mill again asked bessie no never there they both are at the bottom grinding away as hard as they can and that's the reason why the sea is so salt is it salt asked little rosy who never had seen the sea why rosy of course didn't you ever eat codfish they come out of the sea and they're just as salt as salt can be said tom who was about a year older than rosy now molly you tell one said eyebright tell us one which your grandma told you the story of the indian don't you recollect oh yes the one i told you that day in the pasture it's a true story every bit of it every two every bit of it my grandma knew the lady it happened to it was ever and ever so long ago 
when the country was all over woods and indians you know and this lady went to the west to live with her husband he was a pioneer no pioneer no missionary that was what he was missionaries teach poor people and preach and this one was awfully poor himself for all the money he had was just a little bit which a church in the east gave him well after they had lived at the west for a year the missionary had to come back because some of the people said he wasn't orthodox i don't know what that means i asked father once and he said it meant so many things that he didn't think he could explain them all but ma she said it means agreeing with the neighbors anyhow the missionary to tell the folks that he was orthodox and his wife and children had to stay behind in the woods with wolves and bears and indians close by the very day after he started his wife was sitting by the fire with her baby in her lap when the door opened and a great enormous indian walked in and straight up to her i guess she was frightened don't you he gone asked the indian in broken english yes she said then the indian held out his hands and said papoose give oh my cried romaine i'd have screamed right out well the lady didn't continued molly what was the use there wasn't anyone to scream to you know besides she thought perhaps the indian was trying her to see if she trusted him so she let him take the child and he marched away with it not saying another word all that night and all next day she watched and waited but he did not come back she began to think all sorts of dreadful things that perhaps he had killed the child but just at sunset he came with the baby in his arms and the little fellow was dressed like a chief in a suit of doe skins which the squaws had made with cunning little moccasins on his feet and a feather stuck in his hair the indian put him in his mother's lap and said now red man no white squaw friend for she not afraid give child and after that all the time her husband was gone the indians brought venison and game and were real kind to the lady wasn't it nice the children drew long breaths of relief i don't think i could have been so brave declared kitty now i'll tell you a story which i made up myself said romaine who was of a sentimental turn it's called the lady and the barberry bush once upon a time long long ago there was a lady who loved a barberry bush because its berries were so pretty and tasted so nice and sour she used to water it and come at evening to lay her snow-white hand upon its leaves didn't they prick inquired molly who was as practical as romaine was sentimental no of course they didn't prick because the barberry bush was enchanted you know nobody else cared for barberry bushes except the lady all the rest like roses and honeysuckles best but the poor barberry was very glad when it saw the lady coming at last one night when she was watering it it spoke and it said the hour of deliverance has arrived lady behold in me a prince and your lover and it changed into a beautiful knight with barberries in his helmet and knelt at her feet and they were very happy for ever after oh how short complained the rest eyebright's was a great deal longer yes but she read hers in a book you know i made mine up all myself i'll tell you a tory now broke in little rosy it's a nice tory a real nice one once there was a little girl and she wanted some pie she wanted some wheel witch pie and her mother whipped her because she wanted the wheel witch pie then she cried and her mother whipped her then she cried again and her mother whipped her again and the witch pie made her sick and she died she couldn't get well cause the doctor didn't come he couldn't come there wasn't any doctor he was eated up by tigers isn't that a nice story the girls laughed so hard over rosy's story that much abashed she hid her face in kitty's lap and wouldn't raise it for a long time eyebright tried to comfort her 
it's a real nice story she said the nicest of all i'm so glad you came rosie else you wouldn't have told it to us did you hear me tell how the doctor was eaten up by tigers asked rosie peeping with one eye from out of the protection of kitty's apron yes indeed that was splendid i made that up said rosie triumphantly revealing her whole face joyful again and bright as a full moon who'll be next asked eyebright i will said laura listen now for it's going to be perfectly awful i can tell you it's about robbers as she spoke these words laura lowered her voice into a sort of half groan half whisper there was once a girl who lived all alone by herself with just one newfoundland dog for company he wasn't a big newfoundland he was pretty small one night when it was all dark and she was just going to sleep she heard a rustle underneath her bed the children had drawn closer since laura began and at this point romaine gave a loud shriek what was that she asked all held their breaths the loft was getting a little dusky now and sure enough an unmistakable rustle was heard among the hay in a distant corner this loft would be a very bad place for a robber said eyebright in a voice which trembled considerably though she tried to keep it steady a robber wouldn't have much chance with all our men down below james you know girls and samuel and john yes and benjamin and charles chimed in the quick-witted molly and your father eyebright and henry all down there in the barn while they recited this formidable list the little geese were staring with wide open affrighted eyes into the corner where the rustle had been heard and continued eyebright her voice trembling more than ever they have all got pitchforks you know and guns and oh mercy what was that the hay moved girls it did move i saw it all scrambled to their feet prepared to fly but before any one could start the hay in the corner parted and cackling and screaming out flew mrs topknot tired of her hidden nest or of the story-telling and resolved on escape eyebright ran after and shooed her downstairs then she came back laughing and said how silly we are go on laura but the nerves of the party were too shaky still to enjoy robber stories and eyebright perceiving this made a diversion i know what we all want she said some apples stay here all of you and i'll run in and get them i won't be but a minute meant i come too asked the inseparable bessie yes do and you can help me carry em don't tell any stories while we're gone girls come along bess wealthy happened to be in the buttery skimming cream so no one spied them as they ran through the kitchen and down the cellar stairs the cellar was a very large one in fact there were half a dozen cellars opening one into the other like the rooms of a house wood and coal were kept in some of them in others vegetables and there was a swinging shelf where stood wealthy's cold meat and odds and ends of food all the cellars were dark at this hour of the afternoon very dark and bessie held eyebright's hand tight as with the ease of one who knew the way perfectly she sped toward the apple room in the blackest corner of all eyebright paused fumbled a little on the almost invisible shelf with a jar which had a lid and clattered and then handed to her friend a dark something whose smell and taste showed it to be a pickled butternut wealthy keeps her pickles here she said and she lets me take one now and then because i helped to prick the butternuts when she made em i got my fingers awfully stained too it didn't come off for almost a month aren't they good perfectly splendid replied bessie as her teeth met in the spicy acid oval i do think butternut pickles are just too lovely the apple room had a small window in it so it was not so dark as the other cellars eyebright went straight to a particular barrel these are the best ones that are left she said they are those spotty russets which you said you liked bessie now you take four and i'll take four that'll make just one apiece for each of us 
how horrid it would be said bessie as the two went upstairs again with the apples in their aprons how horrid it would be if a hand should suddenly come through the steps and catch hold of our ankles good gracious bessie mother cried eyebright whose vivid imagination represented to her at once precisely how the hand on her ankle would feel i wish you wouldn't say such things at least till we're safely up she added another moment and they were safely up and in the kitchen alas wealthy caught sight of them eyebright she called after them tea will be ready in ten minutes come in and have your hair brushed and your face washed why wealthy judson what an idea it's only twenty minutes past five there's a gentleman to tea to-night and your pa wants it early so's he can get off by six replied wealthy i'm just wetting the tea now don't argue eyebright but come at once i've got to go out to the barn for one minute anyhow cried eyebright impatiently and she and bessie flashed out of the door and across the yard before wealthy could say another word it's too bad she said rushing upstairs into the loft and beginning to distribute the apples that old tea of ours is early tonight and wealthy says i must come in i'm so sorry now that i went for the apples at all because if i hadn't i shouldn't have known that tea was early and then i needn't have gone we were having such a nice time can't you all stay till i've done tea i'll hurry but the loft with its rustles and dark corners was not to be thought of for a moment without eyebright's presence and protection oh no we couldn't possibly we must go home the children said and down the stairs they all rushed brindle and old charlie and the strange horse raised their heads and stared as the little cavalcade trooped by their stalls perhaps they were wondering that there was so much less laughing and talking than when it went up they did not know you see about the perfectly awful robber story or the mysterious rustle or how dreadfully mrs topknot in the dark corner had frightened the merry little crowd End of chapter two chapter three of eyebright by susan coolidge this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter three mr joyce wealthy was waiting at the kitchen door and pounced on eyebright the moment she appeared I want you to know wealthy so I must tell you about her She was very tall and very bony her hair which was black streaked with gray was combed straight and Twisted round a hairpin so as to make a tight solid knot about the size of a half dollar on the back of her head Her face was kind but such a very queer face that persons who were not used to it were a good while in finding out the kindness it was square and wrinkled with small eyes a wide mouth and a nose that was almost flat as if someone had given it a knock when wealthy was a baby and driven it in she always wore dark cotton gowns and aprons as clean as clean could be but made after the pattern of mrs jaffet's in the noah's arks straight up and straight down with almost no folds so as to use as little material as possible she had lived in the house ever since eyebright was a baby and looked upon her almost as her own child to be scolded petted ordered about and generally taken care of eyebright could not remember any time in her life when her mother was not ill she found it hard to believe that mamma ever had been young and active and able to go about and walk and do things which other people did eyebright's very first recollections of her were of a pale ailing person always in bed or on the sofa complaining of headache and backache and general misery coming downstairs once or twice in a year perhaps and even then being the worse for it the room in which she spent her life had a close dull smell of medicines about it and eyebright went past its door and down the entry on tiptoe hushing her footsteps without being aware that she did so so fixed was the habit she was so well and strong herself that it was not easy for her to understand what sickness is or what it needs but her sympathies were quick 
and though it was not hard to forget her mother and be happy when she was rioting out of doors with the other children she never saw her without feeling pity and affection and a wish that she could do something to please or to make her feel better tea was so nearly ready that wealthy would not let eyebright go upstairs but carried her instead into a small bedroom opening from the kitchen where she herself slept it was a little place bare enough but very neat and clean as all things belonging to wealthy were sure to be then she washed eyebright's face and hands and brushed her hair retying the brown bow crimping with her fingers the ruffle round eyebright's neck and putting on a fresh white apron to conceal the ravages of play in the school frock eyebright was quite able to wash her own face but wealthy was not willing yet to think so she liked to do it herself and eyebright cared too little about the matter and was too fond of wealthy beside to make any resistance when the little girl was quite neat and tidy go into the sitting-room said wealthy with a final pat tea will be ready in a few minutes your pa is in a hurry for it so eyebright went slowly through the kitchen which looked very bright and attractive with its crackling fire and the sunlight streaming through its open door and which smelt delightfully of ham and eggs and new biscuit and down the narrow dark passage on one side of which was the sitting-room and on the other a parlour which was hardly ever used by anybody wealthy dusted it now and then and kept her cake in a closet which opened out of it and there were a mahogany sofa and some chairs in it upon which nobody ever sat and some books which nobody ever read and a small franklin stove with brass knobs on top in which a fire was never lighted and an odor of mice and varnish and that was all the sitting-room on the other side of the entry was much pleasanter it was a large square room wainscoted high with green painted wood and had a south window and two westerly ones so that the sun lay on it all day long here and there in the walls and upon either side of the chimney-piece were odd unexpected little cupboards with small green wooden handles in their doors the doors fitted so closely that it was hard to tell which was cupboard and which wall anybody who did not know the room was always a long time in finding out just how many cupboards there were the one on the left-hand side of the chimney-piece was eyebright's special cupboard it had been called hers ever since she was three years old and had to climb on a chair to open the door There she kept her treasures of all kinds Paper dolls and garden seeds and books and scraps of silk for patchwork and the top shelf of all was a sort of hospital for broken toys Too far gone to be played with any longer but too dear for old friendship's sake to be quite thrown away the furniture of the sitting-room was cherry-wood dark with age and between the west windows stood a cherry-wood desk with shelves above and drawers below where mr bright kept his papers and did his writing he was sitting there now as eyebright came in busy over something and in the rocking chair beside the fireplace was a gentleman whom she did not recognize at first but who seemed to know her for in a minute he smiled and said Oh ho here is my friend of this morning is this your little girl mr. Bright Yes replied papa from his desk. She is mine my only one that is mr. Joyce eyebright go and shake hands with him my dear Eyebright shook hands blushing and laughing for now she saw that mr. Joyce was the gentleman who had interrupted their play at recess he kept hold of her hand when the shake was over and began to talk in a very pleasant kind voice eyebright thought i didn't know that you were mr bright's little daughter when i asked the way to his house he said why didn't you tell me and what was the game you were playing which you said was so splendid but which made you cry so hard i couldn't imagine and it made me very curious it was only about lady jane gray answered eyebright i was lady jane and bessie she was margaret and i was going to be beheaded when you spoke to us i always cry when we get to the executions they are so dreadful why do you have them then i think that's a very sad sort of play for two happy little girls like you 
why not have a nice merry game about men and women who never were executed wouldn't it be pleasanter oh no it isn't half as much fun playing about people who don't have things happen to them said eyebright eagerly once we did bessie and i we played at george and martha washington and it wasn't amusing a bit just commanding armies and standing on platforms to receive company and cutting down one cherry tree we didn't like it at all lady jane gray is much nicer than that and i'll tell you another splendid one the children of the abbey we played it all through from the very beginning chapter and it took us all our recesses for four weeks i like long plays so much better than short ones which are done right off mr joyce's eyes twinkled a little and his lips twitched but he would not smile because eyebright was looking straight into his face i don't believe you are too big to sit on my knee he said and eyebright nothing loath perched herself on his lap at once she was such a fearless little thing so ready to talk and to make friends that he was mightily taken with her and she seemed equally attracted by him and chattered freely as to an old friend she told him all about her school and the girls and what they did in summer and what they did in winter and about topknot and the other chickens and her dolls for eyebright still played with dolls by fits and starts and her grand plan for making a cave in the garden in which to keep label sticks and bits of string and her cherished trowel won't it be lovely she demanded whenever i want anything you know i shall just have to dig a little bit and take up the shingle which goes over the top of the cave and put my hand in nobody will know that it's there but me unless i tell bessie she added remembering that almost always she did tell bessie mr joyce privately feared that the trowel would become very rusty and eyebright's cave be apt to fill with water when the weather was wet but he would not spoil her pleasure by making these objections instead he talked to her about his home which was in vermont among the green mountains and his wife whom he called mother and his son charlie who was a year or two older than eyebright and a great pet with his father evidently i wish you could know charlie he said you are just the sort of girl he would like and he and you would have great fun together perhaps some day your father will bring you up to make us a visit that would be very nice said eyebright but shaking her head i don't believe it'll ever happen because papa never does take me away we can't leave poor mamma you know she'd miss us so much here wealthy brought in supper a hearty one in honor of mr joyce with ham and eggs cold beef warm biscuit stewed rhubarb marmalade and by way of a second course flannel cakes for making which wealthy had a special gift mr joyce enjoyed everything and made an excellent meal he was amused to hear eyebright say do take some more rhubarb papa i stewed it my own self and it's better than it was last time and to see her arranging her mother's tea neatly on a tray what a droll little pussy that is of yours he said to her father when eyebright had gone upstairs with the tray she seems all imagination and yet she has a practical turn too it's an odd mixture we don't often get the two things combined in one child no you don't replied mr bright sometimes i think she has too much imagination her head is stuffed with all sorts of notions picked up out of books and you'd think to hear her talk that she hadn't an idea beyond a fairy tale but she has plenty of common sense too and is more helpful and considerate than most children of her age wealthy says she is really useful to her and has quite an idea of cooking and housekeeping i'm puzzled at her myself sometimes she seems two different children rolled into one well if that is the case i see no need to regret her vivid imagination replied his friend a quick fancy helps people along wonderfully imagination is like a big sail when there's nothing underneath it's risky but with plenty of ballast to hold the vessel steady it's an immense advantage and not a danger eyebright came in just then and as a matter of course went back to her perch upon her new friend's knee 
do you know a great many stories she asked suggestively i know a good many i make them up for charlie sometimes i wish you'd tell me one it will have to be a short one then said mr joyce glancing at his wash bright will you see about having my horse brought round i must be off in ten minutes or so then turning to eyebright i'll tell you about peter and the wolves if you like that's the shortest story i know oh do i like stories about wolves so much said eyebright settling herself comfortably to listen little peter lived with his grandmother in a wood began mr joyce in a prompt way as of one who has a good deal of business to get through in brief time they lived all alone he hadn't any other boys to play with but once in a great while his grandmother let him go to the other side of the wood where some boys lived and play with them peter was glad when his grandmother said he might go one day in the autumn he said grandmother may i go see william and jack those were the names of the other boys yes she said you can go if you will promise to come home at four o'clock it gets dark early and i am afraid to have you in the wood later than that so peter promised he had a nice time with william and jack and at four o'clock he started to go home for he was a boy of his word as he went along suddenly on the path before him he saw a most beautiful gray squirrel with a long bushy tail oh you beauty cried peter i must catch you and carry you home to grandmother now this was humbug in peter because grandmother did not care a bit about gray squirrels but peter did so peter ran to catch the squirrel and the squirrel ran too he did not go very fast but kept just out of reach more than once peter thought he had laid hold of him but the cunning squirrel always slipped through his fingers at last the squirrel darted up into a thick tree where peter could not see him any more then peter began to think of going home to his surprise it was almost dark he had been running so hard that he had not noticed this before nor which way he had come and when he looked about him he saw that he had lost his way this was bad enough but worse happened for pretty soon as he plodded on trying to guess which way he ought to go he heard a long low howl far away in the wood the howl of a wolf peter had heard wolves howl before and he knew perfectly well what the sound was he began to run and he ran and ran but the howl grew louder and was joined by more howls and they sounded nearer every minute and peter knew that a whole pack of wolves was after him wolves can run much faster than little boys you know they had almost caught peter when he saw mr joyce paused to enjoy eyebright's eyes which had grown as round as saucers in her excitement oh go on she cried breathlessly when he saw a big hollow tree with a hole in one side there was not a moment to spare the hole was just big enough for him to get into and in one second he had scrambled through and was inside the tree there were some large pieces of bark lying inside and he picked one up and nailed it over the hole with a hammer which he happened to have in his pocket so there he was in a safe little house of his own and the wolves could not get at him at all that was splendid sighed eyebright relieved all night the wolves stayed by the tree and scratched and howled and tried to get in continued mr joyce by and by the moon rose and peter could see them putting their noses through the knot holes in the bark and smelling at him but the knot holes were too small and smell as they might they could not get at him at last watching his chance he whipped out his jackknife and cut off the tip of the biggest wolf's nose then the wolves howled awfully and ran away and peter put the nose tip in his pocket and lay down and went to sleep oh how funny cried eyebright delighted what came next morning came next and he got out of the tree and ran home 
his poor grandmother had been frightened almost to death and had not slept a wink all night long she hugged and kissed peter for half an hour and then hurried to cook him a hot breakfast that's all the story only when peter grew to be a man he had the tip of the wolf's nose set as a breastpin and he always wore it here mr joyce set eyebright down and rose from his chair for he heard his horse's hoofs under the window oh do tell me about the breastpin before you go cried eyebright did he really wear it how funny was it set in gold or how i shall have to keep the description of the breastpin till we meet again replied mr joyce my dear he stooped and kissed her i wish i had a little girl at home just like you charlie would like it too i shall tell him about you and if you ever meet you will be friends i am sure eyebright sat on the doorsteps and watched him ride down the street the sun was just setting and all the western sky was flushed with pink the very colour of rosy seashell mr joyce is the nicest man that ever came here i think she said to wealthy who passed through the hall with her hands full of tea things he told me a lovely story about wolves i'll tell it to you when you put me to bed if you like he's the nicest man i ever saw nicer than mr porter asked wealthy grimly walking down the hall eyebright blushed and made no answer mr porter was a sore subject though she was only six years old when she knew him and had never seen him since he was a young man who for one summer had rented a vacant room in miss fitch's school building he took a great fancy to eyebright who was a little girl then and he used to play with her and carry her about the green in his arms several times he promised her a doll which he said he would fetch when he went home at last he went home and came back but no doll appeared and whenever eyebright asked after it he replied that it was in his trunk one day he carelessly left open the door of his room and eyebright peeping in spied it and saw that his trunk was unlocked now was her chance she thought and without consulting anybody she went in resolved to find the doll for herself into the trunk she dived it was full of things all of which she pulled out and threw upon the floor which had no carpet and was pretty dusty boots and shirts and books and blacking bottles and papers all were dumped one on top of the other but though she went to the very bottom no doll was to be found and she trotted away almost crying with disappointment and leaving the things just as they lay on the floor mr porter did not like it at all when he found his property in this condition and miss fitch punished eyebright and wealthy scolded hard but eyebright never could be made to see that she had done anything naughty he's a wicked man and he didn't tell the truth was all she would say wealthy was deeply shocked at the affair and never let eyebright forget it so that even now after six years had passed the mention of mr porter's name made her feel uncomfortable she left the doorstep presently and went upstairs to her mother's room where she usually spent the last half hour before going to bed it was one of mrs bright's better days and she was lying on the sofa she was a pretty little woman still though thin and faded and had a gentle helpless manner which made people want to pet her as they might a child the room seemed very warm and close after the fresh doorstep and eyebright thought as she had thought many times before how i wish that mother liked to have her window open but she did not say so was your tea nice mamma she asked a little doubtfully for mrs bright was hard to please with food probably because her appetite was so fickle pretty good her mother answered my egg was too hard and i don't like quite so much sugar in rhubarb but it did very well what have you been about all day eyebright nothing particular mamma school you know and after school some of the girls came into our hayloft and told stories and we had such a nice time then mr joyce was here to tea he's a real nice man mamma i wish you had seen him how was he nice it seems to me you didn't see enough of him to judge said the mother 
why mamma i can always tell right away if people are nice or not can't you couldn't you when you were well i mean i don't think much of that sort of judging said mrs bright languidly it takes a long time to find out what people really are years why mamma cried eyebright with wide open eyes i couldn't know but just two or three people in my whole life if i had to take such lots of time to find out i'd a great deal rather be quick even if i changed my mind afterward you'll be wiser when you're older said her mother it's time for my medicine now will you bring it eyebright it's the third bottle from the corner of the mantel and there's a teacup and spoon on the table poor mrs bright her medicine had grown to be the chief interest of her life the doctor who visited her was one of the old-fashioned kind who believed in big doses and three pills at a time and something new every week or two but in addition to his prescriptions mrs bright tried all sorts of queer patterned physics which people told her of or which she read about in the newspapers she also took a great deal of herb tea of different sorts there was always a little porringer of something steaming away on her stove chamomile or bone set or wormwood or snake root or tansy and always a long row of fat bottles with labels on the chimney piece above it eyebright fetched the medicine and the cup and her mother measured out the dose i can't help hoping that this is going to do me good she said it's something new which i read about in the evening chronicle dr bright's cosmopolitan febrifuge it seems to work the most wonderful cures mrs mulravy a lady in pike's gulch idaho got entirely well of consumptive cancer by taking only two bottles and a gentleman from alaska writes that his wife and three children who were almost dead of cholera collapse and heart disease recovered entirely after taking the febrifuge one month it's very wonderful i've noticed that those folks who get well in the advertisements always live in idaho and alaska and such like places where people ain't very likely to go a hunting after them said wealthy who came in just then with a candle now wealthy how can you say so both these cures are certified to by regular doctors let me see yes dr ingham and dr h b peters here are their names on the bottle it's easy enough to make up a name or two if you want em muttered wealthy then seeing that mrs bright looked troubled she was sorry she had spoken and made haste to add however the medicine may be first-rate medicine and if it does you good mrs bright we'll crack it up everywhere that we will eyebright's bedtime was come she kissed her mother for good night and the feeling which she always had that she must kiss her very gently or some dreadful thing might happen her mother break in two perhaps or something wealthy who was in rather a severe mood for some reason undressed her in a sharp summary way declined to listen to the wolf story and went away taking the candle with her but there was little need of a candle in eyebright's room that night for the shutters stood open and a bright full moon shone in making everything as distinct almost as it was in the daytime she was not a bit sleepy but she didn't mind being sent to bed at all for bedtime often meant to her only a second playtime which she had all to herself getting up very softly so as to make no noise she crept to the closet and brought out a big pasteboard box which was full of old ribbons and odds and ends of lace and silk with these she proceeded to make herself fine a pink ribbon went around her head a blue one around her neck a yellow and a purple round either ankle and round her waist over her nightgown a broad red one very dirty to serve as a sash each wrist was adorned with a bit of cotton edging and with a broken fan in her hand eyebright climbed into bed again and putting one pillow on top of the other to make a seat began to play telling herself the story in a low whispering tone i am a princess she said the most beautiful princess that ever was but i didn't know that i was a princess at all because a wicked fairy stole me when i was little and put me in a lonely cottage and i thought i wasn't anything but a shepherdess 
but one day as i was feeding my sheep a neck crow answer he came by and he said princess why don't you have any crown then i stared and said i'm not a princess oh but you are he said a real princess then i was so surprised you can't think bessie oh i forgot that bessie wasn't here and i said i cannot believe in such nonsense as that sir then the necro answer laughed and he said mount this winged steed and i will show you your kingdom which you were stolen away from so i mounted here eyebright put a pillow over the footboard of the bed and climbed upon it in an attitude of a lady on a side saddle oh how beautiful it is she murmured how fast we go i do love horseback dear silly little eyebright riding there in the moonlight with her scraps of ribbon and her bare feet and her nightgown she was a fantastic figure and looked absurd enough to make any one laugh i laughed too and yet i love the little thing and find it delightful that she should be so easily amused and made happy with small fancies imagination is like a sail as mr joyce had said that evening but sails are good and useful things sometimes and carry their owners over deep waters and dark waves which might else dampen and drench and drown End of chapter three Chapter four of Eyebright by Susan Coolidge This Librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Lynn Thompson Chapter four a day with the shakers three weeks after mr joyce's visit the long summer vacation began the children liked school but none the less did they rejoice over the coming of vacation it brought a sense of liberty of long days all their own to do as they liked with which it was worth going to school the rest of the year to feel each new morning was like a separate beautiful gift brought and laid in their hands by an invisible somebody who must be kind and a friend since he continually did this delightful thing for them one hot august afternoon eyebright and two or three of her special cronies had gone for coolness to the ice house a place which they had used as a playroom before on especially sultry days it was a large square underground cave with a shingled roof set over it whose eaves rested on the ground the ice when first put in filled all the space under the roof and it was necessary to climb up to reach the top layer later ice and ground were on a level but by august so much ice had been used or had melted away that a ladder was wanted to help people down to the surface the girls had left the door a little open but still the place was dark and they could only dimly see the tin chest in the corner where wealthy kept her marketing and the shapes of two or three yellow crocks which lay half buried their round lids looking like the caps of droll little drowning chinamen it was so hot outside that the dullness of the ice was as refreshing as very cold water is to people who have been walking in the sun the girls drew long breaths of relief as they entered such a sharp change from heat to cold is not quite safe and i imagine wealthy would probably have had a word to say on the subject had she spied them going into the ice house but wealthy happened to be looking another way that afternoon so she did not interfere and as strange to say it harmed nobody that time we need not discuss the wisdom of the proceeding only don't any of you who read this go and sit in an ice house without getting leave from someone wiser than yourselves oh this is delightful said romaine it's just like the north pole and the arctic regions which pa read about in the book don't you come here sometimes and play shipwreck and polar bears eyebright i should think you would we did once but harry prime broke a butter jar and wealthy was as mad as hops and said we must never play here again and i must never let another boy come into the ice house she didn't say we girls mustn't come though 
and I'm glad she didn't, for it's lovely in hot weather, I think. I wish we had a nice house, sighed Kitty Berry. You do have such lots of nice things, Eyebright, ice houses and hay lofts, and a great big garret and a room to yourself. I wish I was an only child. I'd rather have some brothers and sisters than all the ice houses in creation, said Eyebright, who never had agreed with Kitty as to the advantages of being only. It's a great deal nicer. That's because you don't know anything about it. Brothers and sisters are nice enough sometimes, but other times they're nothing but a plague, snapped Kitty, who seemed out of sorts for some reason or other. You can't imagine what a bother Sarah Jane is to me. She's always taking my things and turning my drawers over and tagging around after me when I don't want her. And if I bolt the door and try to get a little peace and quiet, she comes and bangs and says it's her room too, and I've no business to lock her out. And then Mother takes her part, and it isn't nice a bit. I would a great deal rather be an only child than have Sarah Jane. But don't you have splendid times at night in the morning? I always thought it must be so nice to wake up and find another girl there ready to play and talk. Eyebright's tone was a little wistful. Well, it's nice sometimes, admitted Kitty. Just then, the door at the top of the ladder opened, and a fresh face peeped in. Oh, it's Molly Prime, they all cried. Here we are, Molly, come along. Molly scrambled down the ladder. I guessed where you were, she said. Wealthy didn't know, so I took care not to say a word to her, but just crept round and looked in. Oh, girls, what do you think is going to happen? Something nice. What? Miss Fitch is going to have a picnic and take us to the Shakers. The Shaker settlement was about ten miles from Tunxet. I am not sure that I have remembered to tell you that Tunxet was the name of the place where Eyebright and the other children lived, but it was Tunxet Village. They were used to see the stout, sober-looking brethren in their broad-brimmed hats driving about the place in wagons and selling vegetables, cheese, and apple butter. But, as it happened, none of the children had ever visited the home of the community, and Molly's news produced a great excitement. Goody! Goody! they all cried. When are we going, Molly, and how do you know? Miss Fitch told Father. She came to borrow our big wagon and Ben to drive, and Pa said she could have it and welcome, because he thinks ever so much of Miss Fitch, and so does Mother. We are going on Friday, and we are not to carry anything to eat, because we're sure to get a splendid dinner over there. Mother says nobody makes such good things as the Shakers do. Won't it be lovely? All the school is going, little ones and all, except Washington Wheeler, and he can't, because he's got the measles. Oh, poor little Washington, that's too bad, said Eyebright, but I'm too glad for anything that we're going. I always did want to see the Shakers. Wealthy went once, and she told me about it. She says they're the cleanest people in the world, and that you might eat off their kitchen floor. Well, if Wealthy says that, you may be sure it is true, put in Laura Wheelwright. Ma declares she's the cleanest person she ever saw. Oh, Wealthy says the Shakers wouldn't call her clean a bit, replied Eyebright. They'd never eat off her floor, she says. Shall we really have to eat off a floor? inquired Bessie anxiously oh no that's only a way of saying very clean indeed explained eyebright all was expectation from that time onward till friday came the children were afraid it might rain and watched the clouds anxiously thursday evening brought a thunderstorm and many were the groans and sighs but next morning dawned fresh and fair with clear sunshine and dust thoroughly laid on the roads, so that everything seemed to smile on the excursion. There was but one discord in the general joy, which was that poor little Washington Wheeler must be left behind, with his measles and his disappointment. 
Eyebright felt so sorry for him that she told Wealthy she was afraid she shouldn't enjoy herself. But bless her, no sooner were they fairly off than she forgot Washington and everything else except the nice time they were having, and neither she nor anyone beside noticed the very red and very tear-stained little face pressed against the pane of the upper window of Mr. Wheeler's house to watch the big wagon roll through the village. Such a big wagon and packed so very full. There were twenty-three of them, including Miss Fitch and Ben the driver, and how they all got in is a mystery to this day. The big girls held the little ones in their laps. The boys were squeezed into the bottom, which was made soft with straw, and somehow everybody did have a place, though how I can't explain. The road was new to them after the first two or three miles, and a new road is always exciting, especially when, as this did, it winds and turns, now in the woods, and now out, now sunshiny, and now shady, and does not give you many chances to look ahead and see what you are coming to. They passed several farmhouses where boys whom they had never seen before ran out and raised a shout at the sight of the wagon and its merry load. A horse in a field, who looked like a very tame, good-natured horse indeed, took a fancy to them, and trotted alongside till stopped by a fence. Then he flung up his head and whinnied, as if calling them to come back, which made the children laugh. Soon after that they reached a bit of woodland, where trees arched over the road and made it cool and shady, and there they saw a squirrel running just ahead of the wagon over the pine needles. He did not seem to notice them at first, but the boys whooped and hurrahed, and then he was off in a minute, flashing up a tree trunk like a streak of striped lightning. This was delightful, and no less so a flight of crows which passed overhead, cawing, and flying so low that the children could see every feather in their bodies, which shone in the sun like burnished green-black jet, and the glancing of their thievish eyes. "'Going to steal from some farmer's wheat crop,' said Miss Fitch, and she repeated these verses about a crow, which amused the children greatly. "'Where are you bound to, you sooty black crow? What is that noise which you make as you go?' You are a sad, wicked thief, as I know, held by no honesty, keeping no law. What do you say, sir? The crow, he said, caw. Corn is still green, oh, you naughty, bad crow. Wheat is not ripe in the meadow below. What is your errand? I think it is low, thus to be stuffing and cramming your maw, robbing the farmers. The crow, he said, caw. Bring me my gun, now, you sinful old crow, Right at your back I take aim as you go. You are a thief and the honest man's foe. Therefore I shoot you. Click, bang. But, oh, pshaw! Off flew the crow, and he laughed and said, Caw! By the time that the children had done giggling over the crow rhymes, the Shaker village was in sight, looking against its background of green trees, like a group of nice yellow cheeses, only the cheeses were not round. All the buildings were cream-coloured, and seemed freshly painted. They were so very clean. The windows had no shutters, but inside some of them hung blue paper shades to keep out of the sun. Everything looked thrifty and in excellent order. The orchard trees were heavy with half-grown apples and pears. The grass fields had been newly cut, and nothing could be imagined neater than the vegetable gardens which lay on one side of the houses. All the green things stood in precise straight rows, every beet and carrot and cucumber, with his hands in his own pocket, so to speak. None of that reaching about and intruding on neighbouring premises which most vegetables indulge in, but every one at home with a sedate air and minding his own business. Not a single squash vine could be detected tickling another squash vine. Each watermelon lay in the middle of his hill, with a solemn expression on his large face. The tomatoes looked ashamed of being red, and only a suit of drab apiece seemed wanting. 
to make the pumpkins as respectably grave as the other members of the community two small boys in wide-brimmed hats and legs of discreet tint were weeding these decorous vegetables they raised their heads and took one good stare as the big wagon rattled past then they lowered them again and went on with their work laying the pigweeds which they pulled out of the ground in neat little piles along the garden walk at the door of the principal building a stout butternut colored elder stood waiting as if to learn their business we have driven over to see your village said miss fitch in her pleasant voice and we should like dinner if you can give it to us ye said the elder he pronounced the word as if it was spelled ye that was all he said but he helped the children to get down from the wagon and led the way through a very clean bare passage to a room equally clean and bare where four women in drab gowns with wide collars and stiff white caps were sitting each on a little platform by herself darning stockings with a basket of mending beside her one of these introduced herself to miss fitch as sister samantha she had a round comfortable face and the boys and girls who had felt in awe of the grave elder recovered courage as they looked at her she said they could go round if they wanted to and called a younger sister named dorcas to show them the way sister dorcas had a pale rather dissatisfied face she did not seem so happy as sister samantha she showed the children all that there was to see but she said very little and took no pains to explain anything or to make the visit pleasant they saw the bedrooms where the sisters slept and the bedrooms where the brothers slept all exactly alike comfortable plain and unadorned except for wonderful patchwork quilts on the beds and the gay pulled rugs on the floor they were shown the kitchen where the food for all the community was cooked a kitchen as clean and shining as the waxen cell of a bee and the storerooms full of dried fruits and preserved fruits honey cheeses beeswax woodenware brooms herbs and soap there was an office also where these things were for sale to anyone who should choose to buy and great consultations took place among the children who had almost all brought a little shopping money some chose maple sugar some silk winders some little cakes of white wax for use in work baskets molly prime had a sudden bright thought which she whispered about and after much giggling and mysterious explanations in corners they clubbed together and got a work basket for miss fitch it cost a dollar and a quarter and was a great beauty the children thought miss fitch was very much pleased with it and that added to their pleasure so that the purchase of the work basket was one of the pleasantest events of the day eyebright spent what was left of her money in buying a new mop handle as a present for wealthy who wanted one she knew she was a good deal laughed at by the other boys and girls but she didn't mind that a bit and shouldering her mop handle as if it had been a flagstaff followed with the rest wherever sister dorcas chose to lead them sister dorcas took them to see the big barns sweet with freshly made hay and to the dairy and cheese house with white shelves laden with pans of rich milk and curds the very sight of which made the children hungry next they peeped into the meeting-house for sundays and then they were taken to the room where fruit was packed and sorted here they found half a dozen young shakeresses busy in filling baskets with blackberries for next day's market these shaker girls pleased the children very much they looked so fresh and prim and pretty in their sober costume and so cheerful and smiling eyebright fell in love at once with the youngest and prettiest a girl only two or three years older than herself she managed to get close to her and under pretence of helping with the blackberries drew her a little to one side where they could talk without being overheard do you like to live here she asked confidentially as their fingers met in the blackberry basket yea said the little shakeress glancing round shyly then as she saw that nobody was noticing them she became more communicative 
I like it pretty well she said, but I guess I shan't stay here always Won't you what will you do then where will you go? I Don't know yet, but Ruth Beguin She is my sister in the flesh was once of this family and she left and went back to the world's people and got married She lives up in Canada now and has got two babies She came for a visit once and fetched one of them Sister Samantha felt really badly when Ruth went, but she liked the baby ever so much. I mean to go back to the world's people too some day. Oh my! Perhaps you will get married," suggested Eyebright, greatly excited at the idea. "Perhaps I shall," answered the small Shakeress with unmoved gravity. Then she told Eyebright that her name was Jane, and she was an orphan, and that she and Sister Orpha. Whom she pointed out slept together in one of the bedrooms which the children had seen upstairs and had very good times after the lights were out whispering to each other and planning what they would do when they were old enough to do anything sister Orpha too had a scheme for returning to the world's people perhaps they might go together the idea of these good times rather tickled eyebright's imagination for a few minutes she reflected that perhaps it might be a pleasant thing to come and join the shakers She and sister Jane grew intimate so fast and chattered so merrily that Bessie became jealous and drew near to hear what they were saying and Presently one of the elder shakeresses joined them and gently sent Jane away on an errand Eyebright's chance for confidences was over but she had made the most of it while it lasted and that is always a comfort By the time that they had finished the round of the premises dinner was ready Welcome news for the children were all very hungry It was spread in an enormous dining room of two long tables The men shakers sat at one table and the women shakers at the other Miss Fitch and her scholars were placed with the latter and some of the young sisters waited on them very neatly and quietly Sister Jane was one of these and she took especial care of Eyebright whom she seemed to regard as a friend of her own No one spoke at either table except to ask for something or to say thank you But to make up for this silence a prodigious amount of eating was done No wonder for the dinner was excellent the very best dinner the children thought that they had ever tasted there was no fresh meat, but capital pork and beans vegetables of all kinds Delicious Indian pudding flooded with thick yellow cream brown bread and white rusk graham gems Oatmeal and grits and the best of butter apple sauce maple molasses and plenty of the richest milk Everything was of the nicest material and as daintily clean as if intended for a queen Miss Fitch praised the food and sister Samantha who looked pleased says they try to do things thoroughly as to the Lord Miss Fitch said afterward that she thought this was an admirable idea And she wished more people would try it because then there would be less bad cooking in the world and less saleratus and dyspepsia She said that to be faithful and thorough in everything even in getting dinner ready was a real way of serving God and pleased him too because he looks beyond things and sees the spirit in which we do them At three o'clock the wagon came to the door and they said goodbye to the kind shakers Miss Fitch paid for the dinner, but the elder was not willing to take much They entertained the poor for nothing he said a small compensation from those who were able and willing to pay did not come amiss but a dinner for boys and girls like those he guessed didn't amount to much Miss Fitch privately doubted this it seemed to her that a regiment of grown men could hardly have devoured more in the same space of time Than her hungry 21, but she was grateful to the elder for his kindness and told him so Eyebright parted from sister Jane with a kiss and gave her by way of keepsake the only thing she had a china doll about two inches long which chanced to be at the bottom of her pocket It was a droll gift to make to a solemn little shakeress in drab But Jane was pleased and said she should always keep it 
Then they were packed into the wagon again, and with many good-byes they drove away, kissing their hands to the sisters at the door, and carrying with them a sense of cleanliness, hospitality, and quiet peace, which would make them forever friendly to the name of Shaker. The drive home was as pleasant as that of the morning had been. The children were not at all tired, and in the most riotous spirits. They hurrahed every five minutes, they made jokes and guessed riddles and sang choruses. Tranquidillo was one. We'll bear the storm, it won't be long, another. And Ubidi, which Herman Berry had picked up from a cousin in college, and which they all thought grand. Past the farmhouses they went, past the tree where the squirrel had curled himself to sleep, and the fields from which the thievish crows had flown. They stopped a minute at Mr. Wheeler's to leave some maple sugar for Washington. Not the best diet for measles, perhaps, but pleasant as a proof of kind feeling. And then, one by one, they were dropped at the doors of their own homes. Well, said Wealthy, eyeing her mop handle with great satisfaction, that's what I call sensible. I expected you'd spend your money on some pesky gimcrack or other. I never thought it'd be a handy thing like this, and I am obliged to you for it, Eyebright. Now, run up and see your ma. She was asking after you a while ago. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of Eyebright by Susan Coolidge This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson Chapter 5 how the black dog had his day you've got the black dog on your shoulder this morning that's what's the matter with you said wealthy this metaphorical black dog meant a bad humour eyebright had waked up cross and irritable what made her wake up cross i am not wise enough to explain the old-fashioned doctors would probably have ascribed it to indigestion the new-fashioned ones to nerves or malaria or a febrile tendency deacon berry i think would have called it original sin and wealthy who did not mince matters dubbed it an attack of the old scratch which nothing but a sound shaking would cure very likely all these guesses were partly right and all partly wrong when our bodies get out of order our souls are apt to become disordered too and at such times there always seem to be little imps of evil lurking near, ready to seize the chance, rush in, fan the small embers of discontent to a flame, make cross days crosser, and turn bad beginnings into worse endings. This morning's mischances had begun with Eyebright's being late to breakfast, a thing which always annoyed her father very much. Knowing this, she made as much haste as possible, and ran downstairs with her boots half buttoned fastening her apron as she went she was in too great a hurry to look where she was going and the result was that presently she tripped and fell bumping her head and tearing the skirt of her frock half across this was bad luck indeed for wealthy she knew would make her darn it as a punishment and that meant at least an hour's hard work indoors on one of the loveliest days that ever shone she picked herself up and went into the sitting-room pouting and by no means disposed to enjoy the lecture on punctuality which papa made haste to give and which was rather longer and sharper than it would otherwise have been because eyebright looked so very sulky and obstinate while listening to it you will all be shocked at this account but i am not sorry to show eyebright to you on one of her naughty days all of us have such days sometimes and to represent her as possessing no faults would be to put her at a distance from all of you in fact i should not like her so well myself she has been pretty good so far in this story but she was by no means perfect for which let us be thankful because a perfect child would be an unnatural thing whom none of us could quite believe in or understand eyebright was a dear little girl and for all her occasional naughtiness had plenty of lovable qualities about her and i am glad to say she was not often so naughty as on this day 
when a morning begins in this way everything seems to go wrong with us as if on purpose it was so with eyebright her mother who was very poorly found fault with her breakfast she wanted some hotter tea and a slice of toast a little browner and cut very thin these were simple requests and on any other day eyebright would have danced off gleefully to fulfil them today she was annoyed at having to go and moved slowly and reluctantly she did not say that she felt waiting on her mother to be a trouble but her face and the expression of her shoulders and her dull dawdling movements said it for her and poor mrs bright who was not used to such unwillingness on the part of her little daughter felt it so much that she shed a few tears over the second cup of tea after it was brought this dismayed eyebright but it also exasperated her she would not take any notice but stood by in silence till her mother had finished and then without a word carried the tray downstairs a sort of double mood was upon her down below the anger was a feeling of keen remorse for what she had done and a voice inside seemed to say oh dear how sorry i am going to be for this by and by but she would not let herself be sorry then and stifled the voice by saying half aloud as she went along i don't care it's too bad of mother i wish she wouldn't wealthy met her at the stairfoot how long you've been she said taking the tray from her i can't be any quicker when i have to keep going for more things said eyebright nobody said you could retorted wealthy speaking crossly herself because eyebright's tone was cross mercy on me how did you tear your frock like that you'll have to darn it yourself you know that's the rule fetch your work-box as soon as you've done the cups and saucers eyebright almost replied i won't but she did not quite dare and walked without speaking into the sitting-room where the table was made ready for dishwashing with a tub of hot water towels a bit of soap and a little mop since vacation began wealthy had allowed her to wash the breakfast things on mondays and tuesdays days on which she herself was particularly busy ordinarily eyebright was very proud to be trusted with this little job she worked carefully and nicely and had proved herself capable but today her fingers seemed all thumbs she set the cups away without drying the bottoms so that they made wet rings on the shelves she only half rinsed the teapot left a bit of soap in its spout and ended by breaking a saucer wealthy scolded her she retorted and then wealthy made the speech which i have quoted about the black dog very slowly and unwillingly eyebright sat down to darn her frock it was a long jagged rent requiring patience and careful slowness and neither goodwill nor patience had eyebright to bring to the task her fingers twitched she pshawed and oh deared ran the needle in and out and in irregularly jerked the thread and finally gave a fretful pull when she came to the end of the first needleful which tore a fresh hole in the stuff and puckered all she had darned so that it was not fit to be seen wealthy looked in just then and was scandalized at the condition of the work you can just pick it out from the beginning she said it's a burning shame that a great girl like you shouldn't know how to do better but it's temper that's what it is nothing in the world but temper eyebright you've been as cross as two sticks all day massy knows for what and you ought to be ashamed of yourself whereon she gave eyebright a little shake the shake was like a match applied to gunpowder eyebright flamed into open revolt wealthy ann judson she cried angrily let me alone it's all your fault if i am cross you treat me so i won't pick it out i won't darn it at all and i shall just tell my father that you shook me see if i don't wealthy's reply was a sound box on the ear eyebright's naughtiness certainly deserved punishment but it was hardly wise or right of wealthy to administer it or to do it thus she was far too angry to think of that however that's what you want said wealthy and you'd be a better girl if you got it oftener then she marched out of the room leaving eyebright in a fury i won't bear it 
I won't bear it she exclaimed bursting into tears Everybody is cruel cruel. I run away. I'll not stay in this house another minute not another minute and catching up her sunbonnet she darted through the hall and was out of the gate and down the street in a flash wealthy was in the kitchen her father was out no one saw her go rosie and tom berry who were swinging on their gate called to her as she passed but their gay voices jarred on her ear and she paid no attention to the call tunxit village was built upon a sloping hill whose top was crowned with woods to reach these woods eyebright had only to climb two stone walls and cross a field and a pasture and as they seemed just then the most desirable refuge possible she made haste to do so she had always had a peculiar feeling for woods a feeling made up of terror and attraction they were associated in her mind with fairies and robbers with lost children redbreasts robin hood and his merry men and she was by turns eager and shy at the idea of exploring their depths according to which of these images happened to be uppermost in her ideas today she thought neither of robin hood nor the fairies the wood was only a place where she could hide away and cry and be unseen and she plunged in without a thought of fear in and in she went over stones and beds of moss and regiments of tall brakes which bowed and rose as she forced her way past their stems and saluted her with wafts of woodsy fragrance half bitter half sweet but altogether pleasant there was something soothing in the shade and cool quiet of the place it fell like dew on her hot mood and presently her anger changed to grief she knew not why her eyes filled with tears she sat down on a stone all brown with soft mosses and began to cry softly at first then loudly and more loud not taking any pains to cry quietly but with hard sobs and great gulps which echoed back in an odd way from the wood it seemed a relief at first to make as much noise as she liked with her crying and to know that there was no one to hear or be annoyed it was pleasant too to be able to talk out loud as well as to cry they are so unkind to me she wailed so very unkind wealthy never slapped me before she has no right to slap me i'll never kiss wealthy again never oh she was so unkind oh echoed back the wood in a hollow tone eyebright jumped it's like a voice she thought i'll go somewhere else it isn't nice just here i don't like it so she went back a little way to the edge of the forest where the trees were less thick and between their stems she could see the village below here she felt safer than she had been when in the thick wood she threw herself down in a comfortable hollow at the foot of an oak and half rising half lying began to think over her wrongs I guess if I was dead they'd be sorry she reflected they'd hunt and hunt for me and not know where I was and at last they'd come up here and find me dead with a tear on my cheek and then they'd know how badly they have made me feel and their hearts would nearly break I don't believe father would ever smile again he'd be like the king in the second reader but waves went o'er his son's bright hair he never smiled again only i'm a daughter and it will be leaves and not waves mother she'd cry and cry and as for that old wealthy but eyebright felt it difficult to imagine what wealthy would do under the circumstances her thoughts drifted another way i might go into a convent instead that would be better i guess I'd be a novice first with a white veil and a cross and a rosary and I'd look so sweet and holy that all the other children No, there wouldn't be any other children. Never mind. I'd be lovely anyhow But I'd be a Protestant always I wouldn't want to be a Catholic and have to kiss the Pope's old toe all the time Then by and by I should take that awful black veil Then I could never come out any more 
not ever and i should kneel in the chapel all the time as motionless as a marble figure that would be beautiful eyebright had never been able to sit still for half an hour together in her life but that made no difference in her enjoyment of this idea the abbess will be beautiful too but stern and unrelenting and she'll say daughters when she speaks to us nuns and we shall say holy mother when we speak to her it'll be real nice we shan't have to do any darning but just embroidery in our cells and wax flowers wealthy'll want to come in and see me i know but i shall just tell the porter that i don't want her not ever she's a heretic i shall say to the porter and he'll lock the door the minute he sees her coming then she'll be mad the abbess and meg Genefried. eyebright had just read for the fourth time mrs sherwood's exciting novel called the nun so her imaginary convent was modelled exactly after the one there described the abbess and Mere Genefried will always be spying about and listening in the passage to hear what we say when we sit in our cells embroidering and telling secrets but me and my pauline no i won't call her pauline rosalba sister rosalba that shall be her name we'll speak so low that she can't hear a word then we shall suspect that something strange is taking place down in the cellar i mean the dungeons and we'll steal down and listen when the abbess and the bishop and all of them are trying the sister who has a bible tied on her leg here eyebright gave an enormous yawn and if the mob does come wealthy will be sure to sure to but we shall never know for at this precise moment eyebright fell asleep she must have slept a long time for when she waked the sun had changed his place in the sky and was shining on the western side of the village houses had some good angel passed by lifted the black dog from her shoulder and swept from her mind all its foolish and angry thoughts while she dreamed there under the trees for behold matters and things now looked differently to her and instead of blaming other people and thinking hard things of them she began to blame herself how naughty i was she thought to be so cross with poor mamma just because she wanted another cup of tea oh dear and i made her cry i know it was me just because i looked so cross how horrid i always am and i was cross to papa too and put my lip out at him how could i do so what made me wealthy hadn't any business to slap me though but then i was pretty ugly to wealthy she went on her conscience telling her the truth at last as consciences will if allowed i just tried to provoke her and i called her wealthy ann judson that always makes her mad she never slapped me before not since i was a little mite of a girl oh dear and only yesterday she washed all genevieve's dolly things her blue muslin and her overskirt and all and she said she didn't mind trouble when it was for my doll she's very good to me sometimes almost always she's good oh i oughtn't to have spoken so to wealthy i oughtn't i oughtn't and eyebright began to cry afresh not angry tears this time but bright healthful drops of repentance which cleansed and refreshed her soul i'll go right home now and tell her i am sorry she said impetuously and jumping from her seat she ran straight down the hill and across the field eager to make her confession and to be forgiven eyebright's fits of temper big and little usually ended in this way she had none of that dislike of asking pardon with which some persons are afflicted to her it was a relief a thing to be met and gone through with for the sake of the cheer the blue sky in the heart which lay on the other side of it and the peace which was sure to follow when once the forgive me was spoken in at the kitchen door she dashed wealthy who was ironing with a worried frown on her brow started and exclaimed at the sight of eyebright and sat suddenly down on a chair 
before she could speak eyebright's arms were round her neck i was real horrid and wicked this morning she cried please forgive me wealthy i won't be so naughty again not ever oh don't don't for to her dismay wealthy the grim broke down and began to cry this was really dreadful eyebright stared a moment then her own eyes filled and she cried too what a fool i be said wealthy dashing the drops from her eyes there eyebright there hush dear we won't say any more about it and she kissed eyebright for perhaps the tenth time in her life kisses were rare things indeed with wealthy where have you been she asked presently it's four o'clock and after did you know that have you had any dinner no but i don't want any wealthy i've been in the woods on top of the hill i ran away and sat there and i guess i fell asleep said eyebright hanging her head well your pa didn't come home to dinner for a wonder i reckon he was kept to the mill so we hadn't much cooked i took your ma's up to her but i never let on that i didn't know where you was for fear of worrying her she has worried a good lot anyway here let me brush your hair a little and then you'd better run upstairs and make her mind easy i'll have something for you to eat when you come down eyebright's heart smote her afresh when she saw her mother's pale anxious face you've been out so long she said i asked wealthy and she said you guessed you were playing somewhere and didn't know how the time went i was afraid you felt sick and she was keeping it from me it is so bad to have things kept from me nothing annoys me so much and you didn't look well at breakfast are you sick eyebright no mamma not a bit but i have been naughty very naughty indeed mamma and i ran away then she climbed up on the bed beside her mother and told the story of the morning keeping nothing back all her hard feelings and anger at everybody and her thoughts about dying and about becoming a nun her mother held her hand very tight indeed when she reached this last part of her confession the idea of the wood also was terrible to the poor lady she declared that she shouldn't sleep a wink all night for thinking about it it wasn't a dangerous wood at all explained eyebright there wasn't anything there that could hurt me really there wasn't mamma nothing but trees and stones and ferns and old tumble-down trunks covered with tiny weeny mosses all green and brown and red and some perfectly white so pretty i wish i had brought you some mamma woods are never safe declared mrs bright what with snakes and tramps and wildcats and getting lost and other dreadful things i hardly take up a paper without seeing something or other bad in it which has happened in a wood you must never go there alone again eyebright promise me that you won't eyebright promised she petted and comforted her mother kissing her over and over again as if to make up for the anxiety she had caused her and for the cross words and looks of the morning the sad thing is that no one ever does make up all those sweet words and kind acts of a lifetime cannot undo the fact that once one bad day far away behind us we were unkind and gave pain to someone whom we love even their forgiveness cannot undo it how i wish we could remember this always before we say the words which we afterward are so sorry for and thus save our memories from the burden of a sad load of regret and repentance when eyebright went downstairs she found a white napkin her favorite mug filled with milk a plateful of bread and butter and cold lamb and a large pickled peach awaiting her on the kitchen table wealthy hovered about as she took her seat and seemed to have a disposition to pat eyebright's shoulder a good deal and to stroke her hair wealthy too had undergone the repentance which follows wrath her morning i imagine had been even more unpleasant than eyebright's for she had spent it over a hot ironing table and had not had the refreshment of running away into the woods it's so queer said eyebright with her mouth full of bread and butter i didn't know i was hungry a bit but i am as hungry as can be everything tastes so good wealthy 
that's right replied wealthy who was a little upset and tearful still a good appetite's a good thing next best to a good conscience i think eyebright's spirits were mounting as rapidly as quicksilver bessie mather appeared at the gate as she finished her last mouthful and giving wealthy a great hug eyebright ran out to meet her with a lightness and gaiety of heart which surprised even herself the blue sky seemed bluer than ever before the grass greener the sunshine was like yellow gold every little thing that happened made her laugh it was as though a black cloud had been rolled away from between her and the light i wonder what makes me so particularly happy tonight she thought as she sat on the steps waiting for papa after bessie was gone it's queer that i should when i've been so naughty and all but it was not queer though eyebright felt it so the world never looks so fair and bright as to eyes newly washed by tears of sorrow for faults forgiven and hearts which are emptied of unkind feelings grow light at once as if happiness were the rule of the world and not the exception End of chapter five chapter six of eyebright by susan coolidge this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter six changes it happens now and then in life that small circumstances link themselves on to great ones and in this way become important when otherwise they might pass out of mind and be forgotten such was the case with that day's naughtiness eyebright remembered it always and never without a sharp prick of pain because of certain things that followed soon afterward and of which i must tell you in this chapter miss fitch's winter term opened on the fifteenth of september the boys and girls were not sorry to begin school i think they had played themselves out during the long vacation and it was rather a pleasant change now to return to lessons and regular hours everything seemed new and interesting after three months absence the schoolhouse the green all the cubby holes and hiding places just as shabby playthings laid aside for a while come out looking quite fresh and do not seem like old ones at all there was the beautiful autumn weather beside making each moment of liberty doubly delightful day after day week after week this perfect weather lasted till it seemed as though the skies had forgotten the trick of raining or how to be of any colour except clear dazzling blue the wind blew softly and made lovely little noises in the boughs but there was a cool edge to its softness now which added to the satisfaction of breathing it the garden beds were gay as ever but trees began to show tips of crimson and orange and now and then a brown leaf floated gently down as though to hint that summer was over and the autumn really begun small drifts of these brown leaves formed in the hollows of the road and about fence corners the boys and girls kicked them aside to get at the chestnut burrs which had fallen and mixed with them spiky burrs half open and showing the glossy brown nut within it was a great apple year too and the orchards were laden with ripe fruit nearly all the saturday afternoons were spent by the children in apple gathering or in nutting and autumn seemed to them as summer had seemed before autumn spring before summer and winter in its term before spring the very pleasantest of the four pleasant seasons of the year with so many things to do and such a stock of health and spirits to make doing delightful it is not strange that for a time eyebright remained unconscious of certain things which were taking place at home and which older people saw plainly it did cross her mind once or twice that her mother seemed feebler than usual and wealthy and papa worried and anxious but the thought did not stay being crowded out by thoughts of a more agreeable kind she had never in her life been brought very close to any real trouble wealthy had spoken before her of mrs so-and-so as being in affliction 
and she had seen people looking sad and wearing black clothes but it was like something in a book to her a story she only half comprehended though she vaguely shrank from it and did not wish to read further with all her quick imagination she was not in the least morbid sorrow must come to her she would never take a step to meet it so she went on busy healthy happy full of bright plans and fun and merriment till suddenly one day sorrow came for running in from school she found wealthy crying in the kitchen and was told that her mother was worse much worse and the doctor thought she could only live a day or two longer oh no no wealthy was all she could say at first then why doesn't dr pillsbury give mamma something she demanded for eyebright had learned to feel a great respect for medicine and to believe that it must be able to cure everybody wealthy shook her head it ain't no use speculating about more medicine she said your ma's taken shiploads of em and they ain't never done her any good that i can see no eyebright dear it's got to come and we must make the best of it it's god's will i suppose and there ain't nothing to be said when that's the case oh dear how can god will anything so dreadful sobbed eyebright feeling as if she were brought face to face with a great puzzle wealthy could not answer it was a puzzle to her also but she took eyebright into her lap held her close and stroked her hair gently and that helped as love and tenderness always do some very sad days followed the doctor came and went there was a hush over the house it seemed wrong to speak aloud even and eyebright found herself moving on tiptoe and shutting the doors with anxious care yet no one had said do not make a noise everybody seemed to be waiting for something but nobody liked to think what that something might be eyebright did not think but she felt miserable a great cloud seemed to hang over all her bright little world so happy till then she moped about with no heart to do anything or she sat in the hall outside her mother's door listening for sounds now and then they let her creep in for a minute to look at mamma who lay motionless as if asleep but eyebright could not keep from crying and after a little while papa would sign to her to go and she would creep out again hushing her sobs till she was safely downstairs with the door shut it was such a melancholy time that i do not see how she could have got through with it had it not been for genevieve who dumb as she was proved best comforter of all with her face buried in the lap of genevieve's best frock eyebright might shed as many tears as she liked whispering in the waxen ear how much she wished that mamma could get well how good how very good she always meant to be if she did and how sorry she was that she had ever been naughty or cross to her especially on that day that dreadful day when she ran off into the woods the recollection of which rankled in her conscience like a thorn genevieve listened sympathizingly but not even her affection could pull out the thorn or make its prick any easier to bear i do not like to tell about sad things half so well as about happy ones so we will hurry over this part of the story mrs bright lived only a week after that evening when eyebright first realized that she was so much worse she waked up before she died kissed eyebright for good-bye and said my helpful little comfort these sweet words were the only thing which made it seem possible to live just then all her life long they came back to eyebright like the sound of music and when the thought of her childish faults gave her pain these words which carried full forgiveness of the faults soothed and consoled her after a while as she grew older she learned to feel that mamma in heaven knew much better than mamma on earth could how much her little daughter really had loved her 
and how it grieved her now to remember that ever she should have been impatient or unkind but this was not for a long time afterward and meanwhile her chief pleasure was in remembering that for all her naughtiness mamma had kissed her and called her a comfort before she died after the funeral wealthy opened the blinds which had been kept tight shut till then and life returned to its usual course breakfast dinner and supper appeared regularly on the table papa went again to the mill and eyebright to school she felt shy and strange at first and the children were shy of her because of her black alpaca frock which impressed their imaginations a good deal this wore off as the frock wore out and by the time that eyebright had ripped out half the gathers of the waist and torn a hole in the sleeve which was pretty soon the alpaca lost its awfulness in their eyes and had become as any common dress in the course of a week or two eyebright found herself studying playing and walking at recess with bessie quite in the old way but all the while she was conscious of a change and a feeling which she fought with but could not get rid of that things were not nor ever could be as they had been before this interruption came home was changed and her father was changed eyebright was no longer careless or unobservant as before her mother's death and she noticed how fast papa's hair was turning gray and how deep and careworn the lines about his mouth and eyes had become he did not seem to gain in cheerfulness as time went on but if anything to look more sad and troubled and he spent much of his time at the cherry wood desk calculating and doing sums and poring over account books eyebright noticed all these little things she had learned to use her eyes now and though nobody said anything about it she felt sure that papa was worried about something and in need of comfort she used to come early from play and peep into the sitting-room to see what he was doing if he seemed busy she did not interrupt him but drew her low chair to his side and sat there quietly with genevieve in her lap and perhaps a book not speaking but now and then stroking his knee or laying her cheek gently against it all the time she felt so sorry that she could not help papa but i think she did help for papa liked to have her there and the presence of a love which asks no questions and is content with loving is most soothing of all sometimes to people who are in perplexity and trying to see their way out but none of eyebright's strokes or pats or fond little ways could drive the care away from her father's brow his trouble was too heavy for that it was a kind of trouble which he could not very well explain to a child trouble about business and money things which little people do not understand and matters were getting worse instead of better he was like a man in a thorny wood who cannot see his way out and his mind was more confused and anxious than anyone except himself could comprehend at last things came to such a pass that there was no choice left and he was forced to explain to eyebright it was april by that time he was at his desk as usual and eyebright sitting near had genevieve cuddled in her lap and the swiss family robinson open before her now you're done aren't you papa she cried as he laid down his pen you won't write any more tonight will you but sit in the rocking chair and rest she was jumping up to get the chair when he stopped her i'm not through yet my dear but i want to talk with you for a little while oh papa how nice may i sit on your knee while you talk papa said yes and she seated herself he put his arm round her and for a while stroked her hair in silence eyebright looked up wonderingly yes dear i'll tell you presently i'm trying to think how to begin it's something disagreeable eyebright something which will make you feel very bad i'm afraid oh dear what is it cried eyebright fearfully do tell me papa 
what should you say if i told you that we can't live here any longer but must go away away from this house do you mean papa yes away from this house and away from tunxet too not away for always said eyebright in an awestruck tone you don't mean that papa do you we couldn't live anywhere else for always giving a little gasp at the very idea i'm afraid that's what it's coming to said mr bright sadly i don't see any other way to fix it i've lost all my money eyebright it's no use trying to explain it to a child like you but that is the case all i had is gone nearly there's scarcely anything left not enough to live on here even if i owned this house which i don't not own their own house this was incomprehensible what could papa mean but papa it's our house she ventured timidly papa made no answer only stroked her hair again softly and the mill isn't the mill yours papa she went on no dear i never did own the mill you were too little to understand about the matter when i took up the business it belongs to a company do you know what a company means and the company has failed so that the mill is theirs no longer it's going to be sold at auction soon i was only a manager and of course i lose my place but that isn't so much matter the real trouble is that i've lost my own property too we're poor people now eyebright i've been calculating and i think by selling off everything here i can just clear myself and come out honest but that's all there'll be almost nothing left couldn't you get another mill to manage asked eyebright in a bewildered way no there is no other mill and if there were i shouldn't want to take it i'm too old to begin life over again in the place where i started when i was a boy to work my way up i have worked too worked hard and now i come out in the end not worth a cent no eyebright i couldn't do it he set her down as he spoke and began to walk the room with heavy unequal steps the old floor creaked under his tread there was something very sad in the sound a child feels powerless in the presence of sudden misfortune eyebright sat as if stunned while her father walked to and fro genevieve slipped from her lap and fell with a bump on the carpet but she paid no attention genevieve wasn't real to her just then only a doll it was no matter whether she bumped her head or not mr bright came back to his chair again i'll tell you what i've been thinking of he said i own a little farm up in maine it's about the only thing i do own which hasn't got a mortgage on it or doesn't belong to someone else in one way or another it's a very small farm but there's a house on it some kind of a house and i think of moving up there to live i don't know much about the place and i don't like the plan it'll be lonely for you for the farm is on an island it seems and there's no one else living there no children for you to play with and no school these are disadvantages but on the other hand the climate is said to be good and i suppose i can raise enough up there for our living and not run into debt which is the thing i care most for just now so i've about decided to try it I'm sorry to break up your schooling and take you away from here where you like it so much But it seems the only way open and If you could go cheerfully my dear and make the best of things it would be a great comfort to me That's all I've got to say Eyebright's mind had been at work through this long sentence her reply astonished her father not a little it was so bright and eager What is the island in papa a lake? no not a lake it's in the sea but very near the coast i think there's some way of walking across at low tide but i'm not sure i think i'm rather glad said eyebright slowly i always did want to live on an island 
and I never saw the sea. Don't feel badly, Papa. I guess we shall like it. Mr. Bright was relieved, but he couldn't help shaking his head a little nevertheless. You must make up your mind to find it pretty lonesome, he said compassionately. The Swiss family Robinson didn't, replied Eyebright. But then, she added, there were six of them, and there'll only be four of us, counting Genevieve. If Eyebright had taken the news too calmly, Wealthy made up for it by her wild and incredulous wrath when in turn it was broken to her. Pity's sakes, she cried. Whatever is the man a-thinking about? Carry you off to Maine, indeed, away from folks and church and everything civilized. He's crazy. That's what he is, as crazy as a loon. Papa's not crazy. You mustn't say such things, Wealthy, replied Eyebright indignantly. He feels real badly about going, but we've got to go. We've lost all our money, and we can't stay here. A desert island, too, went on Wealthy, pursuing her own train of reflection. Crocodiles and cannibals, I suppose. I've heard what a godforsaken place it is up there. Who's going to look after you, I'd like to know? You, who never in your life remembered your rubber shoes when it rained, or new winter flannels from summer ones, or best frocks from common. Words failed her. Why, Wealthy, shan't you come with us? cried Eyebright in a startled tone. I? No, indeed, I shan't, then, returned Wealthy. I'm not such a fool as all that. Main, indeed. Then, her heart melting at the distress in Eyebright's face, she swooped upon her, squeezed her hard, and said, what a cross-grained piece I be. Yes, Eyebright, dear, I'll go along. I'll go, no matter where it is. You shan't be trusted to that power of yours if I can help it. And that's my last word in the matter. Eyebright flew to Papa with the joyful news that Wealthy was willing to go with them. Mr. Bright looked dismayed. It's out of the question, he replied. I can't afford it, for one thing. The journey costs a good deal, and when she got there, Wealthy would probably not like it, and would want to come back again, which would be money thrown away. Besides, it is doubtful if we shall be able to keep any regular help. No, Eyebright, we'd better not think of it, even. You and I will start alone, and we'll get some woman there to come and work when it's necessary. That'll be as much as I can manage. Of course, when Wealthy found that there were objections, her wish to go increased tenfold. She begged, and Eyebright pleaded, but Papa held to his decision. There was no helping it, but this difference in opinion made the household very uncomfortable for a while. Wealthy felt injured, and went about her work grimly, sighing conspicuously now and then, or making dashes at Eyebright, kissing her furiously, shedding a few tears, and then beginning work again, all in stony silence. Papa shut himself up more closely than ever with his account books, and looked sadder every day, and Eyebright, though she strove to act as peacemaker and keep a cheerful face, felt her heart heavy enough at times when she thought of what was at hand. They were to start early in May, and she left school at once, for there was much to be done in which she could help Wealthy, and the time was but short for the doing of it all. The girls were sorry when they heard that Eyebright was going away to live in Maine, and Bessie cried one whole recess, and said she never expected to be happy again. Still, the news did not make quite as much sensation as Eyebright had expected, and she had a little sore feeling at her heart, as if the others cared less about losing her than she should have cared had she been in their place. This idea cost her some private tears. She comforted herself by a poem which she called Fickleness, and which began, It is wicked to be fickle, and very, very unkind, and I'd be ashamed. But no rhyme to fickle could she find except pickle, and it was so hard to work that in that she gave up writing the verses and only kept away from the girls for a few days but for all eyebright's doubts 
the girls did care only examination was coming on and they were too busy in learning the pieces they were to speak and practicing for a writing prize which miss fitch had promised them to realize just how sorry they were it came afterward when the examination was over and eyebright really gone and it was a long time a year or two at least before any sort of festival or picnic could take place in tunxet without some child saying wistfully i wish eyebright was here to go don't you could eyebright have known this it would have comforted her very much during those last weeks but the pity is we can't know things beforehand in this world so after all her chief consolation was genevieve to whom she could tell anything without fear of making mischief or being contradicted there's just one thing i'm glad about she said to this chosen confidant and that is that it's an island i never saw any islands neither did you genevieve but i know they must be lovely and i'm glad it's in the sea too but oh dear my poor child how will you get along without any other dolls to play with you'll be very lonely sometimes very lonely indeed i'm afraid End of chapter six chapter seven of eyebright by susan coolidge this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter seven between the old home and the new wealthy said eyebright i want to tell you something wealthy was kneading bread her arms rising and falling with a strong regular motion like the piston of a steam engine she did not even turn her head but dusting a little flour onto the dough went straight on saying briefly well what i've been thinking continued eyebright that when papa and i get to the island perhaps some days there won't be anybody to do the cooking but me and it would be so nice if you would teach me a few things not hard ones you know little easy things I know how to toast now and how to boil eggs and make shortcake and stew rhubarb but papa would get tired of those if he didn't have anything else i am afraid you and your pa'll go pretty hungry i guess if there's no one but you to do the cooking muttered wealthy well what would you like to learn is bread easy to make i'd like to learn that you ain't hardly strong enough said wealthy with a sigh but she set her bowl on a chair as she spoke and proceeded to give eyebright a kneading lesson on the spot it was much more fatiguing than eyebright had supposed it would be her back and arms ached for a long time afterward but wealthy said she got the hang of it wonderfully for a beginner and this praise encouraged her to try again every wednesday and saturday after that she made the bread from the sifting of the flour to the final wrap of the hot loaf in a brown towel wealthy only helping a very little and each time the task seemed to grow easier so that before they went away eyebright felt that she had that lesson at her fingers ends wealthy taught her other things also to broil a beefsteak and poach an egg to make gingerbread and minute biscuit fry indian pudding and prepare and flavor the dip for soft toast all these lessons were good for her and in more senses than one many a heartache flew up the chimney and forgot to come down again as she leaned over her saucepans stirring tasting and seasoning many a hard thought about the girls and their not caring as they ought about her going slipped away and came back brightened into good humor in the excitement of watching the biscuits rise or molding them into exact form and size and how pleasant it was if wealthy praised her or papa asked for a second helping of something and said it was good meanwhile the business of breaking up was going on wealthy whose ideas were of the systematic old-fashioned kind began at the very top of the house and came slowly down clearing the rooms out in regular order 
scrubbing sweeping and leaving bare chill cleanness behind her part of the furniture was packed to go to the island but by far the greater part was brought down to the lower floor and stacked in the best parlor ready for an auction which was to take place on the last day but one it was truly wonderful how many things the house seemed to contain and what queer articles made their appearance out of obscure holes and corners in the course of wealthy's rummagings there were old fire irons old crockery bundles of herbs dried so long ago that all taste and smell had departed and no one now could guess which was sage and which catnip scrap bundles which made eyebright sigh and exclaim oh dear what lots of dresses i would have made for genevieve if only i had known we had these there were boxes full of useless things screws without heads and nails without points stopples which stopped nothing bottles of medicine which had lost their labels and labels which had lost their bottles some former inhabitant of the house had evidently been afflicted with mice for six mouse traps were discovered all of different patterns all rusty and all calculated to discourage any mouse who ever nibbled cheese there were also three old bird cages in which since the memory of man no bird had ever lived a couple of fire buckets of ancient black leather which eyebright had seen hanging from a rafter all her life without suspecting their use and a gun of revolutionary pattern which had lost its lock all these were to be sold and so was the hay in the barn as also were the chickens and chicken coops even brindle and old charlie the day before the auction a man came and pasted labels with numbers on them upon all the things eyebright found twenty-four stuck on the side of her own special little stool which papa had said she might take to the island but which had been forgotten she tore off the label and hid the stool in a closet but it made her feel as if everything in the house was going to be sold whether or no and she half turned and looked over her shoulder at her own back as if she feared to find a number there also wealthy who was piling the chairs together by twos laughed i guess they won't put you up to van Do, she said or if they do i'll be the first to bid there that's the last i never did see such a heap of rubbish as come out of that garret your ma and your grandma too i reckon never throwed away anything in all their days often and often i used to propose to clean out and kind of sort over the things but your ma she wouldn't ever let me they were sure to come in useful some day she said but that day never come and there they be moth and rust corrupted sure enough well tain't no use laying up treasures upon earth we all find that out when we come to clear up after fifty years saving next morning proved fine and sunny and great numbers of people came to the auction some of them brought their dinners in pails and stayed all day for auctions do not occur very often in the country and are great events when they do eyebright who did not know exactly how to dispose of herself sat on the stairs high up where no one could see her and listened to the auctioneer's loud voice calling off the numbers and bids number seventeen one clock who bids two dollars for the clock number eighteen lounge covered with calica i am offered seven fifty for the lounge covered with calica i am offered seven fifty for the lounge covered with calica who bids eight thank you mr brown going at eight gone and number seventeen was the kitchen clock which had told her the hour so many many times the lounge covered with calica was mother's lounge on which she had so often lain it seemed very sad somehow that they should be going gone later in the day she saw from the window people driving away in their wagons with their bargains piled in behind them or set between their knees papa's shaving glass wealthy's wash tubs the bedstead from the best room she could hardly keep from crying 
it seemed as if the pleasant past life in the old house were all broken up into little bits and going off in different directions in those wagons she was still at the window when wealthy came up to search for her eyebright's face was very sober and there were traces of tears on her cheeks eyebright where are you don't stay moping up here tain't no use come down and help me get tea i've made a good fire in the sitting-room and auctions all be the better for supper i reckon auctions is wearing things and always will be to the end of time your pa looks clean tuckered out are all the people gone asked eyebright yes they have and good riddance to them it made me madder than hops to hear em a boastin of the bargains they got mrs doolittle up to the corner bid in that bureau from the keepin room chamber for seven dollars it was worth fifteen the auction man said so himself but to kind of match that her daughter-in-law she give thirty cents a yard for that rag carpet in your room and it didn't cost but fifty when it was new and that was twelve years ago next november so i guess we come out pretty even with the doolittle family after all added wealthy with a dry chuckle eyebright followed downstairs the rooms looked bare and unhomelike with only furniture left which wealthy had bid in for her private use for wealthy did not mean to live out any more but have a small house of her own and support herself by tailoring she had bought a couple of beds a table a few chairs and some cooking things so it was possible though not very comfortable to spend one night more in the house eyebright peeped into the empty parlor and shut the door don't let's open it again she said we'll make believe that everything is there still just as it used to be and then it won't seem so dismal but in spite of make-believes it would have been dismal enough had they not been too busy to think how altered and forlorn the house looked one more day of hard work and all was cleared out and made clean wealthy followed with her broom and actually swept herself out as eyebright said brushing the last shreds and straws through the door and on to the steps where the others stood waiting mr bright locked the door the key turned in the rusty lock with a sound like a groan mr bright stood a moment without speaking then he handed the key to wealthy shook hands with her and walked quickly away in the direction of mr berry's house where he and eyebright were to spend the night wealthy was feeling badly over the loss of her old home and emotion with her always took the form of gruffness no need to set about kissing tonight she said as eyebright held up her face i'm a-coming round to see you off to-morrow then she too stalked away eyebright looked after her for a little while then very slowly she opened the garden gate and went the round of the place once more saying good-bye with her eyes to each well-known object the periwinkle bed was blue with flowers the daffodils were just opening their bright cups old maids wealthy had been used to calling them because their ruffled edges were so neatly trimmed and pinked there was the apple tree crotch where every summer since she could remember her swing had hung there was her own little garden bare now and brown with the dead stalks of last year how easy it would be to make it pretty again if only they were going to stay the cave had fallen in to be sure and was only a hole in the ground but a cave is soon made she could have another in no time if only here eyebright checked herself recollecting that if only did not help the matter a bit and like a sensible child she walked bravely away from the garden and through the gateway she paused one moment to look at the sun which was setting in a sky of clear yellow over which little crimson clouds drifted like a fleet of fairy boats the orchards and hedges were budding fast here and there a cherry tree had already tied on its white hood the air was full of sweet prophetic smells altogether tunxet was at its very prettiest and pleasantest and for all her good resolutions eyebright gave way and wept one little weep at the thought that to-morrow she and papa must leave it all 
she dried her eyes soon for she did not want papa to know she had been crying and followed to mrs berry's where kitty and the children were impatiently looking out for her and every one gave her a hearty welcome but in spite of their kindness and the fun of sleeping with kitty for the first time it seemed grave and lonesome to be anywhere except in the old place where she had always been and eyebright began to be glad that she and papa were to go away so soon the home feeling had vanished from tunxet and the quicker they were off the better she thought the next morning they left starting before six o'clock for the railroad was five miles away early as it was several people were there to say good-bye bessie mother laura wheelwright who hadn't taken time even to wash her face wealthy very grey and grim and silent and dear miss fitch to whom eyebright clung till the very end the last bag was put in mr berry kissed eyebright and lifted her into the wagon where papa and ben were already seated good-byes were exchanged bessie drowned in tears climbed on the wheel for a last hug and was pulled down by someone ben gave a chirrup and the horses began to move and that was the end of dear old tunxet the last thing eyebright saw as she turned for a final look was wealthy's grim sad face poor wealthy who had lost most and felt sorriest of all though she said so little about it it was a mile or two before eyebright could see anything distinctly she sat with her head turned away that papa might not notice her wet eyes but perhaps his own were a little misty for he too turned his head and it was a long time before he spoke the beautiful morning and the rapid motion were helps to cheerfulness however and before they reached the railroad station mr bright had begun to talk to ben and eyebright to smile she had never travelled on a railroad before and you can easily imagine how surprising it all seemed to her at first it frightened her to go so fast but that soon wore off and all the rest was enjoyment little things which people used to railroads hardly notice struck her as strange and pleasant when the magazine boy chucked baloo's dollar monthly into her lap she jumped and said oh thank you and she was quite overcome by the successive gifts as she supposed of a paper of popcorn a paper of lozenges and a prize package containing six envelopes six sheets of note paper six pens a wooden pen handle and a piece of jewelry all for twenty-five cents did he really give them to me she asked papa quite gasping at the idea of such generosity then the ice-water boy came along with his frame of tumblers she had a delicious cold drink and told papa she did think the railroad was so kind which made him laugh and as seeing him laugh brightened her spirits they journeyed on very cheerfully at noon they changed cars and presently after that eyebright became aware of a change in the air a cool freshness and odour of salt and weeds which she had never smelt before and liked amazingly she was just going to ask papa about it when the train made a sudden curve and swept alongside a yellow beach beyond which lay a great shining expanse gray and silvery and blue over which dappled foamy waves played and leaped and large white birds were skimming and diving she drew a long breath of delight and said half to herself and half to papa that is the sea how did you know asked he smiling oh papa it couldn't be anything else i knew it in a minute after that they were close to the sea almost all the way eyebright felt as if she could never be tired of watching the waves rise and fall or of breathing the air which seemed to fill and satisfy her like food though it made her hungry too and she was glad of the nice luncheon which mr berry had packed up for them but even pleasant things have a tiring side to them and as night drew on eyebright began to think she should be as glad of bed as she had been of dinner her heavy head had been nodding for some time and had finally dropped upon papa's shoulder when he roused her with a shake and said wake up eyebright wake up 
here we are at the island she asked drowsily no not at the island yet this is the steamboat to see a steamboat had always been one of eyebright's chief wishes but she was too sleepy at that moment to realize that it was granted her feet stumbled as papa guided her down the stair she could not keep her eyes open at all the stewardess a colored woman laughed when she saw the half-awake little passenger but she was very good-natured whipped off eyebright's boots hat and jacket in a twinkling and tucked her into a little berth where in three minutes she was napping like a dormouse there was a great deal of whistling and screeching and ringing of bells when the boat left the dock heavy feet trampled over the deck just above the berth the water lapped and hissed but not one of these things did eyebright hear nor was she conscious of the rocking motion of the waves straight through them all she slept and when at last she waked the boat was no longer at sea and there was hardly any motion to be felt it was not yet six o'clock the shut-up cabin was dark and close except for one ray of yellow sun which straggled through a crack and lay across the carpet like a long finger it flickered and seemed to beckon as if it wanted to say get up eyebright it is morning at last get up and come out with me she felt so rested and fresh that the invitation was irresistible and slipping from the berth she put on dress and boots which were laid on a chair nearby tied the hat over her unbrushed hair and with her warm jacket in hand stole out of the cabin and ran lightly upstairs to the deck then she gave a great start and said oh with mingled wonder and surprise for instead of the ocean which she had expected to see the boat was steaming gently up a broad river on either side was a bold wooded shore the trees were leafless still for it was much farther north than tunxet but the rising sap had tinted their boughs with lovely shades of yellow soft red and pink brown and there were quantities of evergreens beside so that the woods did not look cold or bare Every half mile or so the river made a bend and curved away in a new direction It was never possible to see far ahead and as the steamer swept through the clear green and silver water It continually seemed that a little farther on the river came to an end and there was no way out except to turn back but always when the boat reached the place where the end seemed to be behold a new reach of water with new banks and tree crowned headlands appeared so that their progress was a succession of surprises here and there were dots of islands too just big enough to afford standing room to a dozen pines and hemlocks so closely crowded together that the trees next the edge almost seemed to be holding fast by their companions while they leaned over to look at their own faces in the water these tiny islets enchanted eyebright with each one they passed she thought oh i hope ours is just like that never reflecting that these were rather play islands than real ones and that genevieve was the only member of the family likely to be comfortable in such limited space as they afforded she had the deck and the river to herself for nearly an hour before any of the passengers appeared when they did she remembered with a blush that her hair was still unbrushed and ran back to the cabin where the stewardess made it tidy and gave her a basin of fresh water for her face and hands she came back just in time to meet papa who was astonished at the color in her cheek and the appetite she displayed at breakfast which was served in a stuffy cabin smelling of kerosene oil and bedclothes and calculated to discourage any appetite not sharpened by early morning air little did eyebright care for the stuffy cabin she found the boat and all its appointments delightful and when after breakfast the old captain took her down to the engine room and showed her the machinery she fairly skipped with pleasure it was a sort of noisy fairyland to her imagination all those wonderful cogs and wheels and shining rods and shafts moving and working together so smoothly and so powerfully she was sorry enough when at eleven o'clock they left the boat and landed at a small hamlet 
which seemed to have no name as yet perhaps because it was so very young eyebright asked a boy what they called the town but all he said in reply was tain't a town and something about a township which he didn't understand at all here they had some dinner and mr bright hired a wagon to take them cross country to scrapplehead which was the village nearest to causey island as eyebright now learned that their future home was called cozy papa pronounced it the name pleased her greatly and she said to herself for perhaps the five hundredth time i know it is going to be nice it was twenty-two miles from the nameless village to scrapplehead but it took all the afternoon to make the journey for the roads were rough and hilly and fast going was impossible eyebright did not care how slowly they went every step of the way was interesting to her full of fresh sights and sounds and smells she had never seen such woods as those which they passed through they looked as if they might have been planted about the time of the deluge so dense and massive were their growths many of the trees were old and of immense size some very large ones had fallen and their trunks were thickly crusted with fungi and long hair like tresses of gray moss here and there were cushions of green moss so rich and luxuriant as to be the softest sitting places imaginable eyebright longed to get out and roll on them the moss seemed at least a yard deep once they passed an oddly shaped broad track by the roadside which the driver told them was the footmark of a bear this was exciting and a little farther on at the fording of a shallow brook he showed them where a deer had stopped to drink the night before and left the impression of its slender hoofs in the wet clay it was as interesting as a story to be there so near the haunts of these wild creatures then leaving the woods they would come to wide vistas of country with pine-clad hills and slopes and beautiful gleaming lakes and twice from the top of an ascent they caught the outlines of a bold mountain range a delicious air blew down from these mountains cool crystal clear and spiced with the balsamic smell of hemlocks and firs and a hundred lovely wood odors beside oh isn't maine beautiful cried eyebright in a rapture she felt a sort of resentment against wealthy for having called it a godforsaken place but wealthy didn't know she never was here was her final conclusion if she ever had been here she couldn't have been so silly it was too dark to see much of scrapplehead when at last they got there it was a small place nestled in an angle of the hills the misty gray ocean lay beyond its voice came to their ears as they descended the last steep pitch a hushed low voice with a droning tone as though it were sleepy time with the great sea there was no tavern in the village and they applied at several houses before finding any one willing to accommodate them by this time eyebright was very tired and could hardly keep from crying as they drove away from the third place what shall we do if nobody will take us in she asked papa dolefully shall we have to sit in the wagon all night guess won't come to that said the cheery driver downs'll take you i'll bet a cookie he will when he came to downs's he jumped out and ran in they're real clever folks he told mrs downs and the little gal is so tired it's a pity to see so mrs downs consented to lodge them and their troubles were over for that day half blind with sleep and fatigue eyebright ate her bread and milk fried eggs and doughnuts fell asleep while she undressed gave her head a knock against the bedpost laughed hurried into bed and in three minutes was lost in dreamless slumber the wind blew softly up the bay the waves sang their droning lullaby a half-grown moon came out twinkled and flashed in the flashing water and sent one long beam in to peep at the little sleeper in bed the new life was begun and begun pleasantly End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of Eyebright by Susan Coolidge 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter Eight, Cozy Island. When Eyebright awoke next morning, she ran straight to the window with the hope that she might see Cozy Island, but the window did not look toward the sea. Only a barn, a bit of winding road, and a green hill with a rocky top were to be seen and she dropped the paper shade with a sense of disappointment dressing herself as fast as she could she ran downstairs mrs downs who was frying fish in the kitchen pointed with a spoon in answer to her question and said it's up that way the island is but tain't much to look at it's too far for you to see the house eyebright didn't particularly care about seeing the house she was satisfied with seeing the island there it lay long and green raised high out of the blue sea like a wall with the water washing its stony shore there seemed to be a good many trees and bushes on top and altogether she thought it a beautiful place and one where a little girl might be happy to live you ain't the folks that's coming to live up to the island be you said mrs downs do tell if you are we heard there was someone there hain't been nobody there for quite a spell back not since the lots went away last year Joe Blot he farmed it for a while but miss lots father he was took sick over to Machias and they moved up to look after him and nobody's been there since unless the boys for blueberries I guess your pa'll find plenty to do to get things straightened out and so will the rest of you there isn't any rest but me do tell now ain't you any ma no said eyebright sadly mother died last november you poor little thing cried kind mrs downs and hain't you got no brothers and sisters either no not any at all why you'll be lonesome i'm afraid up to the island you never lived in such a sort of place before did you oh no we always lived in tunxet but i don't believe i shall be lonesome it looks real pretty from here why is it called cozy island mrs downs well i'm sure i don't know folks always called it that i never thought to ask nobody perhaps he'll know when he comes in he was mr downs but he knew no more than his wife about the name of the island mr bright however was better informed he told them that the name in the first place was causeway from the natural path uncovered at each low tide which connected it with the shore and that this had gradually been changed to causey because it was easier to pronounce eyebright was rather disappointed at this explanation i thought it was cozy she said because the island was cozy mr downs gave a great laugh at this but papa patted her head kindly and said we'll see if we can't make it so eyebright the tide would not serve for crossing the causeway till the afternoon but mr downs offered to put them over in his boat without waiting for that it was arranged that they should come back for the night and mrs downs packed some bread and cheese and doughnuts in a basket to serve them as dinner eyebright took the basket on her arm and ran down to the shore in high spirits it was a lovely day the sea was as blue as the sky and as the boat pushed off little ripples from the incoming tide struck the pebbly beach with swift flashes of white like gleaming teeth and a gay little splash so like a laugh that eyebright laughed too and showed her teeth what are you smiling at asked her father i don't know she answered in a tone of dreamy enjoyment i like it here papa near as the island looked it took quite a long time to reach it though mr downs pulled strongly and steadily it was very interesting as each stroke took them nearer and nearer and showed more and more distinctly what their future home was like the trees which at first had seemed a solid green mass became distinct shapes of pines hemlocks and sumacs a little farther and openings appeared between them through which open spaces on top could be seen bushes a field and yes actually a little brown patch which was the house there it was and eyebright held genevieve up that she might see it too 
that's our house my child she whispered aren't you glad but my don't it look small it was small smaller even than it looked as they found when after saying good-bye to mr downs and getting directions for crossing the causey they climbed the steep path which led to the top and came out close to the house mr bright gave a low whistle as he looked at it and eyebright opened her eyes wide it's a comfort that we're not a large family isn't it she said quaintly i'm almost glad now that wealthy didn't come papa wouldn't she say it was little littler than miss fitch's schoolhouse i do believe the front door was fastened only by a large cobweb left by some industrious spider of last year so it was easy to make their way in there was no entrance hall the door opened directly into a square kitchen from which opened two smaller rooms one had shelves round it and seemed to be a sort of pantry or milk room as they went into the other a trickling sound met their ears and they saw a slender stream of clear spring water running into a stone sink the sink never seemed to get any fuller but the water ran on and on and there was no way to stop it as eyebright found after a little examination isn't that splendid she cried it just runs all the time and we shan't have to pump or anything i do like that so much then as if the sound made her thirsty she held her head under the spout and took a good long drink do taste it it's the best water that ever was she declared this spring water always at hand was the only luxury which the little house afforded all the rest was bare and plain as could be upstairs there were two small chambers but they were more like chicken coops than bedrooms for the walls made of lathes not yet plastered were full of cracks and peep-holes and the staircase which led to them resembled a ladder more than was desirable there was plenty of sunshine everywhere for there were no blinds and the sweet yellow light made a cheerfulness in the place forlorn as it was eyebright did not think it forlorn she enjoyed it very much as though it had been a new doll's house and danced about gleefully planning where this should go and that how papa's desk should have a corner by the window and her little chair by the other and the big mahogany table which wealthy had persuaded them to bring by the wall she showed a good deal of cleverness and sense in their arrangement and papa was well content that things should be as she liked we must have the upstairs rooms plastered i suppose he said that'll require some time i'm afraid plaster takes so long to dry we must arrange to wait at mr downs's for a week or two i bright he sighed as he spoke and sat down on the doorstep his elbows on his knees his chin in his hands looking tired and discouraged oh must we cried eyebright her face falling this won't be nice a bit papa i've got an idea don't plaster the walls let me fix them i'll make them real nice just as nice as can be if you will and then we shan't have to wait at all why what can you do with them how do you mean demanded her father oh papa it's a secret i'd rather not tell you i'd rather have it a surprise mayn't i papa demurred but eyebright coaxed and urged and at last he said well i don't care about it one way or the other try your idea if you like eyebright it will amuse you perhaps and anything will do for the summer we can plaster in the fall I don't believe you'll want to remarked eyebright shaking her head mysteriously my way is much prettier than plaster just you wait and see papa i'm sure you'll like it but papa seemed downhearted and it was not easy to make him smile to tell the truth the look of the farm was rather discouraging he kicked the earth over with his foot and said the soil was poor and everything seemed run down but eyebright would not give in to this view at all it was a lovely place she insisted and she ran about discovering new beauties and advantages every moment now it was a thicket of wild roses just budding into leaf 
Next a patch of wintergreen with white starry blossoms and red berries Then peeping over the bank she called papa's attention to a strip of pebbly beach on the side of the island next the sea Here's where we can take baths she said why I declare Here's a path down to it. I guess the people who used to live here made it don't you oh do come and see the beach papa it was a rough little path which led to the beach and overgrown with weeds but they made their way down without much trouble and eyebright trampled the pebbles underfoot with great satisfaction isn't it splendid she cried see that great stone close to the bank papa we can go behind there to dress and undress it's a real nice place i'm going to call it the dressing room how wide the sea is on this side and what is that long point of land papa for the island lay within a broad curving bay one end of the curve projected only a little way but toward the north a long cape-like tongue of land with a bold hilly outline ran out to sea and made a striking feature in the landscape those are the guinness hills said mr bright canada begins just the other side of them do you see those specks of white on the point that is Malachi, and in the summer there is a steamboat once a week from there to Portland. We can see it passed in clear weather, Mr. Downs says. That will be nice, said Eyebright comfortably. I'm glad we've got a beach of our own, Papa, aren't you? Now I want to look about some more. To the left of the house the ground rose in a low knoll, whose top was covered with sassafras bushes. This was the source of the spring whose water ran into the back kitchen They came upon it presently and could trace the line of spouts each made of a small tree trunk Halved and hollowed out which led it from the hill to the house Following these along Eyebright made the discovery of a cubby a veritable cubby left by some child in a choice and hidden corner formed by three overlapping moosewood bushes the furniture except for a table made of three shingles consisted entirely of corn cobs but it was a desirable cubby for all that and would be a pleasant outdoor parlor for genevieve in hot days eyebright thought it made the island seem much more homelike to know that other children had lived there and played under the trees and cheered by this idea she became so merry that gradually papa brightened too and began to make plans for his farming operations with more heart than he had hitherto shown deciding where to plant corn and where potatoes and where their little vegetable garden would better be i suppose it's no use to try for fruit he said the climate is too cold not too cold for blueberries eyebright replied there are lots of them mrs downs said and lots of cranberries and mr. Downs's brother has got an apple tree an apple tree dear dear thinking of getting to a place where people only have one apple tree muttered mr. Bright By the time that they had made the circuit of the island it was twelve o'clock This was dinner time eyebright declared and she produced the lunch basket Mrs. Downs's bread had yellow specks of saleratus in it and was very different from wealthy's delicious loaves but they were too hungry to criticize though eyebright shook her head over it and thought with satisfaction of the big parcel of yeast powder which she and wealthy had packed up she knew exactly where it was in the corner of a certain red box and that reminded her to ask papa when the boxes would be likely to come they are due at this moment he replied i suppose we may look for them at any time now Mr. Downs says there have been headwinds for this week past and I presume that has kept the sloop back Perhaps she may come today. I Do hope she will I want dreadfully to begin and fix the house Doesn't it seem a great while since we left Tunxit, papa? I can't believe that it is only three days so much has happened The tide had been going out since 11 o'clock and by four when they were ready to cross the and having water way was uncovered it was a wide pathway of sand not flat and even all the way but high in some places and low in others with shells and pebbles shining here and there on its surface it was like a beach 
except for being narrower and having water on both sides instead of on only one the sand was still wet enough to make good hard footing and eyebright skipped gaily over it declaring that she felt just like the children of israel in the middle of the red sea it's so strange to think that just a little while ago this was all water she said and just a little while longer and it will be all water again it is the most interesting thing we've got on our island i think papa but it makes me feel a little afraid too there's nothing to be afraid of if you're only careful not to come here except when the tide is going out said her father now bright you must never try to cross when the tide is rising even if the sand looks perfectly dry and the water seems a good way off the sea comes in very fast up here on these northern shores and if you made a misstep and sprained your ankle or had an accident of any kind you might be drowned before anyone could come to your help remember my child yes papa i will said eyebright looking rather nervously at the water it was slipping farther away every moment and seemed the most harmless thing in the world but papa's words made her feel as if it were a dangerous and deceitful creature which could not be trusted it was over a mile from the causeway to the village though at first sight the distance looked much less plodding along the sandy shore was slow work so that they did not reach the village till nearly six a smell of frying met them as they entered the door mrs downs wishing to do them honor was making blueberry flapjacks for tea did any of you ever eat blueberry flapjacks i imagine not unless you have summered on the coast of maine they are a kind of greasy pancake in which blueberries are stirred till the cakes are about the color of a bruise they are served swimming in melted butter and sugar and in any other place or air would be certain indigestion if not sudden death to any person partaking of them but somehow in that place and that air they are not only harmless but seem quite delicious as well eyebright thought so she ate a great many flapjacks thought them extremely nice and slept like a top afterward with never a bad dream to mar her rest a big gray sail at the wharf was the glad sight that met their eyes when they came down next morning the sloop had come in during the night with all mr bright's goods on board he had hoped that it might be possible to land them on the island but the captain said it was out of the question he couldn't get near enough for one thing and if he could he wouldn't for how were heavy things like them to be dumped on a shelving bank like that he'd like to know so the goods were landed on the dock at scrapplehead and mr downs undertook to find an ox team to draw them across the causeway at low tide getting oxen was not an easy matter at that season of the year but mr downs who had taken a fancy to his lodgers bestirred himself and at last found some one willing to let his yoke go in consideration of a dollar and a quarter so at exact low tide the great cart piled with boxes and barrels creaked slowly across the sandy bar mr downs driving and papa walking behind with eyebright who was more than ever reminded of the crossing of the red sea it took much lugging and straining and jeeing and hawing to get the load up the steep bank on the other side but all arrived safely at last in front of the house there the cart was unloaded as fast as possible a few things set indoors the rest left outside and getting into the cart they all drove back across the causeway it was harder work than when they came for the tide was rising and the sand had grown soft and yielding one great swirling wave ran up and curled around the oxen's hoofs just as they reached firm ground but though eyebright gave a little scream and mr downs frowned and said by gosh no harm was done and the momentary fright only made pleasanter their arrival to scrapplehead which they reached just as the sun sank for the night into a great soft-looking bed of purple and crimson clouds this was their last night with the Downs family. Early next morning they started for the island in Mr. Downs's boat, 
taking with them their last bundles and bags and mrs downs who had kindly offered to give them a day's help very helpful it proved for there was everything to do mr bright like all men wanted to do everything at once and eyebright was too inexperienced to know what should come first and what second so mrs downs's good sense and advice were of great value under her directions the bedrooms were swept and cleaned and the bedsteads put together first of all for as she said you've got to sleep anyhow and if you don't do it comfortable you'll be sick and that would never do next while eyebright swept the kitchen she and mr bright got the stove into place fixed the pipe and lighted a fire after which mrs downs scoured the pantry shelves and unpacked china and tins there she said surveying the rest with great satisfaction that begins to look folksy what's sewed up in that old comforter a rocking chair let's have it out so the rocking chair was unsewed and papa's desk and the big table were unpacked and as each familiar article came to view eyebright felt as though an old friend were restored to her she patted the arm of her own little chair and put the plaided cover from the old sitting-room over the table with a sense of cheer and comfort she and papa and mrs downs dined on bread and cheese in the intervals of work and by five o'clock they were very fairly in order and mrs downs made ready to go back to her own family eyebright walked with her as far as the causeway and parted with a hearty kiss mrs downs seemed like a second wealthy almost she had been so kind and thoughtful all that busy day papa was sitting in the rocking chair by the stove when she went back she stopped to kiss him as she passed and proceeded to set the table and get supper mrs downs had started them with a supply of bread butter and milk but the tea and sugar came out of one of the tunxet boxes and so did the tumbler of currant jam opened in honour of the occasion wealthy had made it and it seemed to taste of the pleasant old times eyebright did not care to think much about wealthy just then the tide was drawing over the causeway cutting them off from everybody else in the world she felt lonely and the least bit afraid in spite of papa's being there and only keeping very busy till bedtime saved her from homesickness which she felt would be a bad beginning indeed for that first evening in her new home next morning was fair all the days had been good so far which was fortunate for a half-settled house is a dismal place enough in rainy weather eyebright opened her eyes and after one bewildered stare began to laugh for through the slats of her coop she could distinctly see papa half dressed and brushing his hair in his on the other side of the entry this was not to be endured so after breakfast while he went to the village for some provisions she set to work with great energy on her plan for reforming the bedroom walls this was to cover them with picture papers there was an abundance of material for that purpose at hand for her mother had taken harper's bazaar and frank leslie's illustrated for several years and as she saved all the back numbers a large pile had collected which wealthy had carefully packed these eyebright sorted over setting aside all the pictures of cows and statesmen and steamboats and railroad chains for papa's room and keeping the kittens and dogs and boys and girls and babies for her own she fastened the papers to the lathes with tacks and the ceilings were so low for she was able to do all but the very top row herself that she was forced to leave for papa so hard did she work that the whole of his room was done before he appeared climbing the path with a big bundle under one arm a basket in his hand and looking very worn and tired it's a hard pull up the shore he said wiping his forehead i shall have to get a boat whether i can afford it or not i'm afraid it'll be worse when hot weather comes and there'll always be the need of going over to the village for something or other a boat cried eyebright clapping her hands oh papa that would be splendid i can learn to row it my own self can't i it'll be as nice as a carriage of our own nicer for we shan't have to catch the horse or feed him either now papa 
let me carry the basket and oh do come quick i want to show you how beautifully i have done your bedroom papa liked the bedroom very much he was glad to be saved the expense and delay of plastering only he said he was afraid he should always be late to breakfast because he should want to lie in bed and study his picture gallery which joke delighted eyebright highly it was several days before she had time to attend to her own papering for there was a great deal else to do boxes to unpack places to settle and outside work to begin mr bright hired a man for one week to plough and plant and split wood after that he thought he could keep things in running order by himself he had been brought up on a farm but years of disuse had made him stiff and awkward at such labour and he found the work harder than he had expected eyebright was glad to see the big woodpile grow it had a cosy look to her and gradually the house was beginning to look cosy too the kitchen with its strip of carpet and easy chairs and desk made quite a comfortable sitting room eyebright kept a glass of wild roses or buttercups or white daisies always on the table she set up a garden of her own too after a while and raised some balsams and johnny jump-ups from seeds which mr downs gave her and some golden brown coreopsis as for the housekeeping it fared better than could have been expected with only a little girl of thirteen to look after things once a week a woman came from the village for the day and half a dollar did the washing and part of the ironing roasted a joint of meat if there was one to roast made a batch of pies perhaps or a pan of gingerbread and scoured the pots and pans and the kitchen floor this lightened the work for the next seven days and left eyebright only vegetables and little things to cook and the ordinary cleaning bed making and dusting to do which she managed very well on the whole though sometimes she got extremely tired and wished for wealthy's strong hands to help her milk and butter came from mr downs's every other day and papa was very good and considerate about his food and quite contented with a dinner of potatoes or mush if nothing better was to be had so the little housekeeper did not have any heavy burden on her mind so far as he was concerned the boat proved a great comfort when it came which was not till more than a month after their settlement on cozy island eyebright took regular rowing lessons and practised diligently so that after a few weeks she became really expert and papa could trust her to go alone as far as the village when the weather was fair and the sea smooth these rows to and fro were the greatest treats and refreshments after housework sometimes it happened that her errands kept her till sunset and she floated home on the incoming tide just dipping the oars gently in now and then and carried along by the current and a singing wind which followed close behind and pushed the boat on its way these were eyebright's real play times she kept a story going about a princess and a boat and some water fairies and a water prince and whenever the chance came for a solitary row she acted it by herself in the old pleasant way always wishing that bessie or some other girl could be along to play it with her another girl someone to share work and fun waking and sleeping with her that was all which was wanted she thought to make Cozy Island as pleasant as Tunxet. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of Eyebright by Susan Coolidge This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson Chapter 9 Shut Up in the Oven You will probably think that it was a dish of pork and beans, or an indian pudding of the good old-fashioned kind which was being shut up in the oven not at all you are quite mistaken the thing shut up in the oven was eyebright herself and the oven was quite different from anything you are thinking of cold not hot wet not dry with a door made of green sea water instead of black iron this sounds like a conundrum and as that is hardly fair i will proceed to unriddle it at once and tell you all about it the oven was a sort of cave or grotto in the cliffs 
four miles from Scrapplehead, but rather less than three from the causeway. Its real name was the Devil's Oven. Country people, and main country people above all others, are very fond of calling all sorts of strange and striking places after the devil. If Eyebright had ever heard the whole name, perhaps she might not have ventured to go there alone as she did, in which case I should have no adventure to write about. But people usually spoke of it for shortness's sake as the oven, and she had no idea that Satan had anything to do with the place, nor, for that matter, have I. It was from Mrs. Downs that she first heard about the oven. Mrs. Downs had been there once, years before. It was a natural curiosity, she said, with all sorts of strange sea creatures growing in pools, and the rocks were red and quite beautiful. It wasn't a dangerous place, either, and here Mr. Downs confirmed her. You couldn't get in after half-tide, but anybody could stay in for a week in ordinary weather, and not to be drowned. There were plenty of places atop of the cave where you could sit and keep dry, even at high water, though it would be sort of pokey, too. Eyebright's imagination was fired by this description, and she besought Papa to take her there at once. He promised that he would some day, but the day seemed long in coming, as holidays always do to busy people, and June passed and july and still the oven was unvisited though eyebright did not forget her wish to go august came at last the delicious north of maine august with hot brilliant noons and cool balmy nights so different from the murky steamy august of everywhere else and was half over when one afternoon papa came in with a piece of news what should you say eyebright if i were to go off for the whole day to-morrow he asked why papa bright what do you mean you can't there isn't anywhere to go there's malachi oh papa not in our little boat no in a schooner belonging to mr downs's brother it has just put in with a load of lumber and the captain has offered to make me a passage if i like to go he expects to get back tomorrow evening about nine o'clock should you be lonesome do you think eyebright if i went not a bit cried eyebright delighted at the idea of papa's having a sail i'll do something or other that is pleasant perhaps i'll go and stay all day with mrs downs anyhow i'll not be lonely i'm glad the captain asked you to go papa it'll be nice i think but next morning when she had given papa his early breakfast watched him across the causeway and seen the sails of the schooner diminish into two white specks in the distance she was not sure that it was nice she sang at her dishwashing and clattered her cups and spoons to make as much noise as possible but for all she could do the house felt silent and empty and she missed papa very much her plan had been to go to the village as soon as her work was done and make mrs downs a visit but later another idea popped into her mind she would go to the oven instead i know about where it is she thought if i keep close to the shore i can't miss it anyway mr downs said it wasn't more than two miles and three quarters from the causeway two miles and three quarters isn't a very long walk it won't be half tide till after ten i can get there by a little after nine if i start at once that'll give me an hour to see the cave and when i come back i'll go down to the village and stay to dinner with mrs downs i'll take some bread and butter though because one does get so hungry up here if you take the least little walk what a good idea it is to do this i'm glad papa went to malachi after all her preparations were soon made and in ten minutes she was speeding across the causeway, which was safe walking still, though the tide had turned, her pocket full of bread and butter and Genevieve in her arms. She had hesitated whether or not to take Genevieve, but it seemed too sad to leave her all alone on the island, so it ended in her going too, in her best bonnet and a little blanket shawl. The morning was beautiful, dewy and fresh, 
and the path along the shore was scented with freshly cut hay from inland fields and with spicy bayberry and sweet fern a belated wild rose shone here and there in the hedges pale and pink tangles of curly green-brown fringe lay over the clustering virgin's bower the blue lapping waves as they rose and fell were full of seaweeds of a lovely red-brown tint and a frolicsome wind played over the surface of the sea and seemed to be whispering something funny to it for the water trembled in the sun and dimpled as if with sudden laughter the way as a general thing lay close by the shore winding over the tops of low cliffs covered with dry yellow grasses now and then it dipped down to strips of shingle beach or skirted little coves with boundaries of bushes and brambles edging the sand miles are not easy to reckon when people are following the ins and outs of an irregular coast half a dozen times eyebright clambered to the water's edge and peeped round the shoulder of a great rock thinking that she must have got to the cave at last yet nothing met her eyes but more rocks and surf and fissures brown with rust and barnacles at last she came on a group of children playing in the sand and stopped to ask the way of them there were two thin brown little girls in pink and gray gingham frocks and pink and gray striped stockings appearing over the tops of high laced boots they were exactly the same size and made eyebright think of grasshoppers they were so wiry and active and sprang about so nimbly then there were three rosy hearty looking country children and a pair of little boys with sharp delicately cut faces who seemed to be brothers for they looked like each other and quite unlike the rest all seven were digging holes in the sand with sticks and shovels and were as much absorbed in their work as a party of diligent beavers when eyebright appeared with genevieve in her arms they stopped digging and looked at her curiously do you know how far the oven is from here asked eyebright no and what's the oven answered the children and one of the gray and pink little girls added my what a big doll eyebright scarcely heeded these answers she was so delighted to see some children after her long fast from childhood what are you making she asked a fort replied one of the boys now Fweddy, you said you'd call it a castle put in one of the girls well castles are just the same things as forts my mother said so is that your mother sitting there asked eyebright catching a glimpse of a woman and a baby under a tree not far off oh dear no that's mrs warrigan she's jenny's mother you know and mandy's and peter paul rubens she's not our mother at all my mother's name is mrs brown and my papa is dr azariah p brown we live in new york city did you ever see new york city no never i wish i had said eyebright it's a real nice place went on the pink and gray midge you'd better make haste and come and see it quick cause it's dt rotting every day my papa says so don't you think dr azariah p brown is a beautiful name i do when i'm married and have a little boy i'm going to name him dr azariah p brown because it's the beautifulest name in the world she's gauged already said the other little sister she's gauged to willie prentice and she's got a gagement wing only she turns the stone round inside so's to make people believe it's her plain gold wing and she's married already isn't that cheating it's just as bad as telling a real story no it isn't either cried the other twirling a small gilt ring round on a brown finger and revealing a gem made apparently of second-rate sealing wax and about the colour of a lobster's claw no it isn't cheating not one bit cause sometimes the wing gets turned round all by itself and then people can see that it isn't plain gold and Nellie's gauge too just as much as I am only she hasn't got any wing could Henry sin now Lottie screamed Nellie flinging herself upon her you mustn't tell the name So your name is Lottie is it said eyebright who had abandoned Genevieve to the embraces of Jenny and was digging in the sand with the rest 
no it isn't my real name is charlotte p only mamma calls me lottie i don't like it much it's such a short name just lottie look here you didn't ever see me till today so it can't make much difference to you so won't you please call me charlotte p i'd like it so much if you would eyebright hastened to assure charlotte p of her willingness to grant this slight favor are these little boys your brothers Lock charlotte p i mean she asked oh no cried nelly our brother is lots and lots bigger than they are that's sinclair and freddy they ain't no lation at all cept that they live next door their mamma's a widow interposed charlotte p she plays on the piano and a real handsome gentleman comes to see her most every day that's what being a widow means look here what i found shouted sinclair who had gone farther down the beach i guess it's a shrimp and if i had a match i'd make a fire and cook it for i read in a book once that shrimps are delicious let me see him let me see him clamoured the little ones then in a tone of disgust oh my ain't he horrid looking and little he isn't any bigger than the head of a pin that's not true asserted sinclair he's bigger than the head of my mamma's shawl pin and that's ever so big i don't believe he's good a bit declared lottie then you shan't have any of him when he's cooked said sinclair i've got a jellyfish too he's in a hole with a little water in it but he can't get out i mean to eat him too a jellyfish good to eyebright i don't believe they are she replied i never heard of anybody's eating them i like fishes went on sinclair my mamma says she guesses i've got a taste for na natural history when i grow up i mean to read all the books about animals and what do you like asked eyebright of the other little boy who had not spoken yet and whose fair baby face had an odd almost satirical expression fried hominy was the unexpected reply uttered in a sharp distinct voice the children shouted and eyebright laughed but freddie only smiled faintly in a condescending way and now eyebright remembered that she was on her road to the cave a fact quite forgotten in the moment and she jumped up and said she must go perhaps mrs warrigan will know where the oven is she added i guess so replied lottie because she does know about a great many many things good-bye do come again to-morrow and bring dolly won't you and she gave genevieve one kiss and eyebright another you're pretty big to play with dolls i think but then meditatively she's a pretty big doll too mrs warrigan was knitting a blue yarn stocking she could tell eyebright nothing about the oven i know it's not a great way off she said but i've never been there it can't be over a mile if it's so much as that that i'm sure of have you walked up all the way from scrapplehead i want to know it's a long way for you to come not so far as new york city said eyebright laughing those little girls tell me they come from there yes the twins and sinclair and freddie all come from new york their mother miss brown who is a real nice lady was up here last year she took a desperate fancy to the place and when the children had scarlet fever in the spring and lottie was so sick that the doctor didn't think she'd ever get over it she just packed their trunk and sent them right off here just as soon as they was fit to travel she said all she asked was that i'd feed em and do for em just as i do for my own and you wouldn't believe how much they've improved since they came they looked peaked enough still but for all that nobody'd think they were the same children and did the little boys come with them yes their neighbors miss brown wrote and their mother wanted to go to the springs or somewhere so she asked mightn't they come too at first i thought i couldn't hardly manage with so many but they haven't been a bit of trouble just set them down anywheres down on the shore and they'll dig all day and be as happy as clams the only bad thing is boots miss brown she sent seven pairs apiece in the trunk and you would hardly believe it they're on the sixth pair already rocks is dreadful hard on leather and so is sand but i guess their ma won't care so's they go back strong and healthy 
I am sure she won't said Eyebright now I must be going or I shan't be able to get into the cave when I find it You'd better come in and get a bite of something to eat as you come back said mrs. Warrigan That's the house just across that pasture take but a step out of your way Oh, thank you. How kind you are replied Eyebright Then she said good-bye and hurried on thinking to herself Maine is full of good people I do believe I wish wealthy would come up here and see how nice they are it seemed more than a mile to the oven but she made the distance longer than it was by continually going down to the water's edge to make sure that she was not passing the cave without knowing it it was almost by accident that in the end she lighted upon it strolling a little out of her way to pick a particularly blue harebell which had caught her eye she suddenly found herself on the edge of a hollow chasm and peeping over perceived that it must be the place she was in search of scrambling down from her perch which was about half way up one side she found herself in a deep recess overhung by a large rock which formed a low archway across its front the floor ran back for a long distance rising gradually in irregular terraces till it met the roof and here and there along these terraces were basin-like holes full of gleaming water which must be the pools mrs. Downs had talked about Eyebright had never seen a cave before though she had read and played about caves all her life So you can imagine her ecstasy and astonishment at finding herself in a real one at last It was as good as the Arabian night she thought and a great deal better than the cave in the Swiss family Robinson Indeed it was a beautiful place cool green light filled it like sunshine filtered through sea water the rocky shells were red or rather a deep rosy pink and the water in the pools was of the color of emerald and beautifully clear she climbed up to the nearest pool and gave a loud scream of delight for there under her eye was a miniature flower garden made by the fairies it would seem and filled with dahlia shaped and hollyhock shaped things purple crimson and deep orange which were flowers to all appearance and yet must be animals for they opened and shut their many tinted petals and moved and swayed when she dipped her fingers in and splashed the water about there were green spiky things too exactly like freshly fallen chestnut burrs lettuce like leaves pale red ones as fine as tissue paper and delicate filmy foliage in soft brown and in white yellow snails clung to the sides of the pool vivid in color as the blossom of a trumpet creeper and as she lay with her face close to the surface of the water a small bright fish swam from under the leaves and darted across the pool like a quick sun ray never in her dreams had eyebright imagined anything like it and in her delight she gave genevieve a great hug and cried aren't you glad i brought you dear oh isn't it beautiful there were several pools one above another and each higher one seemed more beautiful than the next below the very biggest dahlia of all an enemy was its real name but eyebright did not know that was in the highest of these pools and eyebright lay so long looking at it and giving it an occasional tickle with her forefinger to make it open and shut that she never noticed how fast the tide was beginning to pour in at last one great wave rolled up and broke almost at her feet and she suddenly bethought herself that it might be time to go alas the thought came too late as in another minute she saw the rocks at the side down which she had climbed were cut off by deep water she hurried across to the other side to see if it were not possible to get out there but it was even worse and the tide ran after as she scrambled back and wetted her ankles before she could gain the place where she had been sitting before she made this disagreeable discovery that wasn't safe either for pretty soon a splash reached her there and she took genevieve in her arms and climbed up higher still feeling like a hunted thing and as if the sea were chasing her and would catch her if it possibly could it was a great comfort just then to recollect what mr downs had said about the cave being safe enough for people who were caught there by the tide in ordinary weather eyebright worried a little over that word 
ordinary but the sun was shining outside and she could see its gleam through the lower waves the water came in quietly which proved that there wasn't much wind and altogether she concluded that there couldn't be anything extraordinary about this particular day i think she proved herself a brave little thing and sensible too to be able to reason this out as she did and avoid useless fright but for all her bravery she couldn't help crying a little as she sat there like a limpet among the rocks and realized that the oven door was fast shut and she couldn't get out for ever so many hours all of a sudden it came to her quite distinctly how foolish and rash it was to have come there all alone without permission from papa or letting anybody know of her intention it was one comfort that papa at that moment was in malachi and couldn't be anxious about her but oh dear eyebright thought how dreadfully he would feel if i never did get out and he came back and found me gone and nobody could tell him where i was i'll never do such a bad naughty thing again never if i ever do get out that is she reflected as the water climbed higher and higher and again she moved her seat to avoid it still with a sense of being a hunted thing which the sea was trying to catch her seat was now too far from the pools for her to note how the anemones and snails were enjoying their twice a day visit from the tide how the petals quivered and widened the weeds grew brighter and the fish darted about with renewed life and vigor i don't believe it would have been much comfort to her if she had seen them fishes are unfriendly creatures they never seem to care anything about human beings or whether they are feeling glad or sorry genevieve for all her being made of wax was much more satisfactory what was particularly nice she let eyebright her blanket shawl to wear for the cave had begun to feel very chilly the shawl was not large but it was better than nothing and with this round her shoulders and dolly cuddled in her arms she sat on the very highest ledge of all and watched the water rise she couldn't go any higher so she hoped it couldn't either and as she sat she sang all the songs and hymns she knew to keep her spirits up out on the ocean shining shore how she wished herself on one rosalie the prairie flower old dog tray and ever so many others it was a very miscellaneous concert but it did as well for eyebright and the fishes as the most classical music could have done better perhaps for mozart and beethoven might have sounded a little mournful and songs without words would never have answered songs with words were what were wanted in that emergency the tide halted at last after filling the cave about two-thirds full once sure that it had turned and was going down eyebright felt easier and could even enjoy herself again she ate the bread and butter with a good appetite only wishing there was more of it and then made up a delightful story about robbers and a cave and a princess in which she herself played the part of the princess who was shut in the cave of an enchanter till a prince should come and release her through the hole in the top by the time that this happened and the princess was safely out the uppermost pool was uncovered and eyebright clambered down the wet rocks and took another long look at it making believe that it was a garden which a good fairy had planted to amuse the princess and indeed no fairy could have invented a prettier one so little by little and following the receding water she was able at last with a jump and a long step to reach the rocky pathway by which she had come down and two minutes later she was on top of the cliff again and in the sunshine which felt particularly warm and pleasant the sun was halfway down the sky she had been in the cave almost six hours and she knew it must be late in the afternoon neither mrs warrigan nor the party of children was visible as she passed the house they had probably gone in for tea and she did not stop to look them up for a great longing for home had seized upon her the tide delayed her a little while at the causeway so that it was past six when she finally reached the island and her boots were wet from the soaked sand but she didn't mind that a bit 
she was so very glad to be safely there again she pulled them off put on dry stockings and shoes made the fire filled the tea kettle set the table and after a light repast of bread and milk curled herself up in the rocking chair for a long nap she did not wait till nearly nine when papa came in having been set ashore by the schooner's boat as it passed by he had a large codfish in his hand swung from a loop of string well it has been a nice day he said cheerfully rubbing his hands the wind was fair both ways we did some fishing and i caught this big fellow i don't know when i have enjoyed anything so much what sort of a day have you had little daughter eyebright began to tell him but at the same time began to cry which made her story rather difficult to understand mr bright looked very grave when at last he comprehended the danger she had been in i shan't dare to go anywhere again he said i thought i could trust you eyebright i supposed you were too sensible and steady to do such a wild thing as this i am very much surprised and very much disappointed these words were the heaviest punishment which eyebright could have had for she was proud of being trusted and trustworthy papa had sat down and was leaning his head on his hand in a dispirited way all his bright look was overclouded the pleasant day seemed forgotten and almost spoiled she felt that it was her fault and reproached herself more than ever oh please don't say that papa she pleaded tearfully i can be trusted really and truly i can i won't ever go to any dangerous place alone again really i won't just forgive me this time and you'll see how good i'll be the rest of my life so papa forgave her and she kept her promise and never did go off on any thoughtless expeditions again as long as she lived on cozy island End of chapter nine Chapter Ten of Eyebright by Susan Coolidge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter Ten, a long year in a short chapter. It was Christmas Eve, and Eyebright, alone in the kitchen, was hanging up the stockings before going to bed. Papa, who had a headache, had retired early so there was no one to interrupt her she only wished there had been half the fun of christmas seems missing when there is nobody from whom to keep a secret no mystery no hiding of things in corners and bringing them out at just the right moment very carefully she tied papa's stocking to the corner of the chimney and proceeded to fill it that is to put in a pair of old fur gloves which she had discovered in one of the boxes and had mended by way of a surprise and a small silk bag full of hickory nut meats carefully picked from the shells these were all the christmas gifts she had been able to get for papa and the long gray stocking leg looked very empty to her eyes she had wished much to knit him a comforter but it was three weeks and more since either of them had been able to get to the village besides which she knew that papa felt very poor indeed and she did not like to ask for money even so little as would have carried out her wish this must do she said with a quick sigh then she hung up her own stocking and went upstairs eyebright had always hung up her stocking on christmas eve ever since she could remember and she did it now more from the force of habit than anything else forgetting that there was no wealthy at hand to put things in and that they were living on an island which since winter began seemed to have changed its place and swung a great deal farther away from things and people and the rest of the world than it had been for winter comes early to the main coasts long before thanksgiving the ground was white with snow and it stayed white from that time on till spring after the first heavy storm the farmers turned out with snow ploughs to break paths through the village as more snow fell it was shoveled out 
and thrown on either side of the path till the long double mounds half hid the people who walked between but there was no one to break a path along the shore toward the causeway the tide rising and falling kept a little strip of sand clear for part of the distance and on this eyebright now and then made her way to the village but it was a hard and uncertain walk and as rowing the boat was very cold work it happened sometimes that for weeks together neither she nor papa left the island or saw anybody except each other this would have seemed very lonely indeed had not the housework filled up so much of her time papa had no such resource after the wood was chopped and the cow fed and a little snow shuffled perhaps that was all he could not find pleasure as eyebright did in reading over and over again a book which he already knew by heart the climate did not brace and stimulate him as it did her the cold affected him very much he moped in the solitude and time hung heavily upon his hands eyebright often wondered how they could ever have got along or in fact if it could have been possible to get along at all without their cow papa had bought her in the autumn when he began to realize how completely they were to be shut off from village supplies in bad weather she was a good-natured yellow beast without any pedigree or any name till eyebright dubbed her goldenrod partly because of her color and partly because the field in which she grazed before she came to them was full of goldenrod which the cow was supposed to eat though i dare say she didn't she gave a good deal of milk not of the richest quality for her diet was rather spare but it was a great help and comfort to have it with milk potatoes cabbages and beets from their own garden flour indian meal and a barrel of salt beef in store there was no danger of starvation on cozy island though eyebright at times grew very tired of ringing the changes on those few articles of diet and trying to invent new dishes with which to tempt papa's appetite which had grown very poor since the winter set in altogether life on the island was a good deal harder and less pleasant now than it had been in summer time and the sea was a great deal less pleasant eyebright loved it still but her love was mingled with fear and she began to realize what a terrible thing the ocean can be the great gray waves which leaped and roared and flung themselves madly on the rocks were so different from the blue rippling waves of the summer that she could hardly believe it the same sea and even when pleasant days came and the waves grew calm and the beautiful color returned to the water still the other and frightful look of the ocean remained in her memory and her bad dreams were always about storms and shipwrecks many more boats passed between malachi and scrapplehead in winter than in summer now that the inland roads were blocked with snow and the boston steamer had ceased to run the mails came that way being brought every other week in a sailboat even rowboats passed to and fro in calm weather and what with lumber vessels and fishing smacks and an occasional traveller from out of the way canada sails at sea or the sound of clinking oars off the bathing beach became of frequent occurrence these little boats out in the great fierce ocean weighed heavily on eyebright's mind sometimes especially was this the case when heavy fogs wrapped the coast as occasionally they did for days together making all landmarks dangerously dim and indistinct at such times it seemed as if cozy island were a big rocky lump which had got in the way and against which ships were almost certain to run she wished very much for a lighthouse and she coaxed papa to let her keep a kerosene lamp burning in the window of her bedroom on all foggy and very dark nights the little gal's lamp the malachi sailors called it and they learned to look for it as a guide though its reflective power was not enough to make it serviceable in a fog which was the chief danger of all 
There was no fog, however, when she opened her eyes on Christmas morning, but a bright sun just rising, which was a sort of Christmas present in itself. She made haste to dress, for she heard Papa moving in his room, and she wished to get down first. But he was as quick as she, and they finally met at the stair-top and went down together. When he saw the stockings, he looked surprised and vexed. "'Dear me, did you hang up your stocking, Eyebright?' he asked in a depressed tone. "'I quite forgot it was Christmas. You'll have no presents, my child, I'm afraid.' "'Never mind, Papa. I don't care. I don't want anything,' said Eyebright. She spoke bravely, but there was a lump in her throat, and she could hardly keep from tears. It seemed so strange and dreadful not to have anything at all in her stocking, not one single thing. She had not thought much about the matter, but with childish faith had taken it for granted that she must have something, some sort of a present, and for a moment the disappointment was hard to bear. Papa looked very much troubled, especially when he spied his own stocking, and perceived that his little daughter had remembered him while he had forgotten her. He spent the morning rummaging his desk and the trunks upstairs, as if in search of something, and after dinner announced that he was going to the village to get the mail. The mails came into Scrapplehead twice a week, but he seldom had any letters, and Eyebright never, so, as a general thing, they were not very particular about calling regularly at the post office. Eyebright wanted to go too, but the day was so cold that Papa thought she would better not. She wrapped him in everything warm she could find, and drew the fur gloves over his fingers with great satisfaction. "'They will keep you quite warm, won't they?' she said. "'Your fingers would almost freeze without them, wouldn't they? You like them, don't you, Papa?' "'Very much,' said Mr. Bright, giving her a good-bye kiss. Then he stepped into the boat and took the oars, while she wrapped her arms in her shawl and watched him row away. Her breath froze on the air like a cloud of white steam. She felt her ears tingle, and presently ran back to the house, feeling as if Jack Frost were nipping her as she ran, but with glowing cheeks and spirits brightened by the splendid air. Just before sunset, Papa came rowing back. He was almost stiff with cold, but when once he had thawed out in the warm kitchen, he seemed none the worse for that. It was quite exciting to hear from the village after such a long silence. Papa had seen Mrs. Downs and Mr. Downs and the children. Benny had had the mumps, but he was almost well again. Mrs. Downs sent her love to Eyebright, and a mince pie pinned up in a towel. This was very nice, but when Eyebright unpinned the towel and saw the pie, she gave a scream of dismay. "'Why, Papa, it's all hard,' she said, "'and it's just like ice. Touch it, Papa. Did you ever feel anything so cold?' In fact, the pie was frozen hard and had to be thawed for a long time in the oven before it was fit to eat. While this process was going on, Papa produced a little parcel from his pocket. It was a Christmas present, a pretty blue necktie. Eyebright was delighted, and showed her gratitude by kissing Papa at least a dozen times, and dancing about the kitchen. "'Oh, and here's a letter for you, too,' he said. "'A letter for me? How queer! I never had a letter before that I remember. Why, it's from Wealthy. Papa, I wish you'd read it to me. It looks very hard to make out. Wealthy writes such a funny hand. Don't you recollect how she used to work over her copy-book, with her nose almost touching the paper, and how inky she used to get? It was the first time they had heard from Wealthy since they left Tunxet more than eight months before. Wealthy wrote very few letters, and those few cost an amount of time, trouble, and ink spots, which would have discouraged most people from writing at all. This was the letter. Dear Eyebright, I take my pen in hand to tell you that I am well, and hope you are the same. All the friends here is well, except Miss Berry. 
she's down with intermitting fever and old miss beadles is dead and buried whether that's being well or not i can't say some folks think so and some folks don't i ain't written before i ain't much of a scribe as you know so i judge you haven't been surprised at not hearing of me i might have writ sooner but along in the fall my arm was kind of lamed with rheumatism and when i got over that there was mandy harmon's wedding things to do pelletire harmon's daughter down to the corners you know what girls want so many clothes for when they get married i can't for the life of me tell the shops don't shut up for good just afterwards so far as anybody knows but you'd think they did from the fuss some of them make mandy had five new dresses they was cut down to worcester but i made them besides two calicus and ten of everything and a double gown and an ulster and the lord knows what i've had to stick to it to put em through but they're all done at last and she got married last week and went off and she'll spend the next few years a alterin' of them things over or i miss my guess that mother girl keeps asking me about you but i tell her you hain't wrote but twice and i don't know no more than she does mr berry got your pa's letter we was glad to hear you liked it up there but most places is pleasant enough in summer winter is the tug i suppose it's cold enough where you are sometimes judging from probabilities mr asher has took the house tell your pa it don't look much like old times he has put wooden points on top of the barn and mended the back gate but he's got a nasty newfoundland which barks most all the time now i must conclude yours truly wealthy a judson p s my respects to your pa and to all inquiring friends i was thinking that that waterproof of your ma's had better be cut over for you in the spring what kind of help do you get up in maine oh how like dear funny old wealthy that is cried eyebright as between smiles and tears she listened to the reading of this letter whom do you suppose she means by all inquiring friends and isn't it just like her to call bessie that mother girl wealthy never could endure bessie i can't imagine why well this has been a real nice christmas after all i'm glad you didn't go to the post office last week papa for then we should have got the letter sooner and shouldn't have had it for today it was much nicer to have it now winter's the tug eyebright thought often of this sentence of wealthy's as the long weeks went by and still the cold continued and the spring delayed till it seemed as though they were never coming at all and papa grew thinner and more listless and discouraged all the time the loneliness and want of occupation hurt him more than it did eyebright and when spring came as at last it did his spirits did not revive as she had hoped they would farming was trying and depressing work on cozy island the land was poor and rocky out of heart as the saying is and mr bright had neither the spirit nor the money to bring it into condition he missed his old occupation and his old neighbors more than he had expected he missed newspapers and a growing anxiety about the future and about eyebright who was getting no schooling of any kind combined to depress him and give him the feeling that he had dropped out of life and there was no use in trying to make things better it was certainly a disadvantage to eyebright at her age to be taken out of school still life on the island was a schooling for all that and schooling of a very useful kind history and geography are excellent things but no geography or history can take the place of the lessons which eyebright was now learning lessons in patience unselfishness good humor and helpfulness when she fought with her own little discontents and vexations and kept her face bright and sunny for papa's sake she was gaining more good than she could have done from the longest chapter in the best school book ever printed not that the school books are not desirable too or that eyebright did not miss them after the first novelty of their new life was over she missed school very much not the fun of school only but the actual study itself her mind felt 
as they say teething dogs do as if they must have something to bite on she tried the experiment of setting herself lessons but it did not succeed very well there was no one to explain the little difficulties that arose and she grew puzzled and confused and lost the desire to go on another thing which she missed very much was going to church there had never been either a church or a sunday school in scrapplehead and the people who made any difference for sunday made it by idling about which was almost worse than working at first eyebright tried to observe the day after a fashion by learning a hymn and studying a short bible lesson but such good habits drop off after a while and there is nothing when there is nothing and nobody to remind or help us and little by little she got out of the way of keeping it up and sometimes quite forgot that it was sunday till afterward days were much alike on the island especially in winter and it was not easy to remember which must be her excuse but it was a sad want in her week and a want which was continually growing worse as she grew older altogether it was not a good or wholesome life for a child to lead and only her high spirits and sweet healthful temper kept her from being seriously hurt by it it was just now that mr joyce's words were proved true and the quick power of imagination with which nature had gifted her became her best friend it enabled her to take sights and sounds into the place of playfellows and friends mixing them with her life as it were and half in fun half in earnest getting companionship out of them skies and sunsets flowers waves birds all became a part of the fairy world which lay always at hand and to which her mind went for change and rest from work too hard and thoughts over anxious for a child to bear she was growing fast but the only signs she gave of growing older were her womanly and thoughtful ways about papa and his comforts and a slight very slight difference in her feeling toward genevieve whom she played with no longer though she took her out now and then when she was quite alone and set her in a chair opposite as better than no company at all eyebright had no idea of being disloyal to this dear old friend but her eyes had opened to the fact that genevieve was only wax and do what she could it was impossible to make her seem alive any more her rapid growth was another trouble for she could not wear the clothes which she had brought with her to the island and it was very hard to get others papa had no money to spare she knew and she could not bear to worry him with her difficulties so she went to mrs downs instead mrs downs had her hands full of sewing for him and her three boys still she found time to advise and help and between her fitting and eyebright sewing a skirt and jacket were concocted out of the waterproof designated by wealthy which though rather queer in pattern did nicely for cool days and relieved eyebright from the long-legged sensation which was growing over her this with a calico some of mrs bright's underclothing altered a little and a sunbonnet with a deep cape made a tolerable summer outfit gloves ruffles ribbons and such little niceties she learned to do without and when the sweet summer came again with long days and warm winds when she could row sit out of doors as much as she liked and swing in the wild great hammocks which festooned the shore she did not miss them girls on desert islands can dispense with finery but summers in maine are very short and as lengthening days and chilly nights began to hint at coming winter eyebright caught herself shivering and knew that she dreaded it very much how long it will seem she thought and how will poor papa bear it and what am i to do when all mamma's old clothes are worn out i don't suppose i shall ever have any new ones and how i am to manage i cannot imagine End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of Eyebright by Susan Coolidge This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Recording by Lynn Thompson 
Chapter Eleven A Storm on the Coast. Summers are short in Maine, still, the autumn that year seemed in no haste to begin its work. September came and went, bringing only trifling frosts, and the equinoctial week passed without a storm. In its place appeared an odd yellow mist which wrapped the world in its folds and made the most familiar objects look strange and unnatural not a fog it was not dense enough for that it seemed more like air made visible thickened just a little and tinted with color but common air still warm thin and quiet the wind blew softly for many days there was a general hush over land and sea and the sun blinked through the golden haze like a bigger and hotter moon this strange atmosphere lasted so long that people grew accustomed and ceased to wonder at it some of the old sailors shook their heads and said it would end with a gale but old sailors are fond of prophesying gales and nobody was frightened by the prediction or saw any reason for being so as long as the weather remained thus warm and perfectly calm the little steamer from Malachi to Portland made her last trip for the season on the 30th of September and the day before Mr. Bright who had some potatoes to ship to market Went over with them to Malachi in a small sailboat belonging to Captain Jim Mr. Downs's brother's son They were not to return till next day So it was arranged that Eyebright should spend the night with mrs. Downs as papa did not like to leave her alone on the island she went with him as far as the village and kissed him for good-bye on the dock when the little cargo was all aboard and Captain Jim just ready to push off I Shall go home early tomorrow and make some egg toast and some frizzled beef for your supper papa So mind you don't stop to tea with mrs. Downs were her last words All right, I won't said her father and Captain Jim laughed and said you'd better not put the frying pan on till you see us a coming For with this light wind there's no knowing when we'll get over and the frizzle might be spiled Then the sail flapped and filled and off they went over the yellow sea Eyebright watched till the boat passed behind the island and out of sight Then she walked up the road to the Downses saying to herself what funny weather I never saw anything like it it isn't a bit like last September Next morning showed the same sultry mist a little thicker if anything Eyebright stayed with mrs. Downs till after dinner helped in the weekly baking hemmed two crash towels Told Benny a story and set out for home a little after four carrying a blueberry pie in a basket for papa's supper as she toiled over the sand of the causeway and up the steep path she was conscious of a singular heaviness in the air and it struck her that the sea was making a sound such as she had never heard before a sort of odd shuddering moan as if some creature was in pain a long way out from shore the water looked glassy calm and there did not seem to be much wind which made the sound even stranger and more startling but she forgot about the sound when she reached the house for there was a great deal to do and not much time to do it in For captain Jim expected to get back by six o'clock or soon after What with sweeping and dusting and fire making an hour passed rapidly When suddenly a dusky darkness settled over the house and at the same moment a blast of wind blew the door open with a bang Oh Dear there is going to be a thunderstorm thought I bright she was afraid of thunder and lightning and did not like the idea at all Going to the door to shut it she stopped short for she saw a strange sight One side of the heavens was still thick with the yellow haze But toward the sea a bank of black clouds was whirling rapidly up from the horizon It had nearly reached the zenith and had already hidden the Sun and turned the afternoon into temporary twilight the sea was glassy smooth near the shore as smooth as oil But farther out the waves had begun to toss and tumble and the moaning sound was become a deep hollow boom Which might easily be imagined the very voice of the approaching storm 
filled with anxiety eyebright ran down to the cliff above the bathing beach and looked toward the long cape at the end of which lay malachi the dots of houses showed plainer and whiter than usual against the cape which had turned of a deep slate gray almost black two or three ships were in sight but they were large ships far out at sea and the strange darkness and the confusion and tumble of the waves which every instant increased made it difficult to detect any object so small as a boat she was just turning away when a sudden gleam of light showed what seemed to be a tiny sail far out in the bay but it disappeared and at the same moment a sudden violent wind swept in from the sea and almost threw her down she caught hold of a sapling stem to steady herself and held tightly till the gusts passed next instant came a great roar of blinding rain and she was forced to run as fast as she could to the house it took but two minutes to reach it but already she was drenched to the skin and the water was running in streams from her dress and the braids of her hair she had to change all her clothes as she sat before the fire drying her hair with a rough towel she could hear the rain pouring on the roof with a noise like thunder and every few minutes great waves of wind surged against the house making it shake and tremble till the rafters creaked there were other sounds too odd rattlings deep hollow notes like groans and a throbbing as of some mighty pulse but there was no thunder indeed eyebright doubted if she could have heard it had there been any so loud was the tumult of noises she sat by the fire and dried her hair what else was there to do but feeling all the time as if she ought to be out in the rain helping papa somehow the tears ran down her cheeks now and then she wrung her hands tightly and said oh papa oh papa never had she felt so little and helpless and lost in all her life before she tried to say a prayer but it seemed to her just then that god could not hear a weak small voice like hers through such a rage of storm she could not realize what it would have been such a comfort to feel that god is never so near his children or so ready to listen as when storms are wildest and they need him most and so she sat till by and by the clock struck six and made her jump at the idea that papa might come in soon and find no supper ready for him i mustn't let that happen she thought as with shaking hands she mended the fire laid the table and set the kettle on to boil she would not allow herself to question the fact that papa would come must come though he might be a little late and she shaved the dried beef broke the eggs and sliced bread for toasting so as to be able to get supper as soon as possible after he should appear this helped her through with another hour still no sign of papa and still the storm raged as it seemed more furiously than ever eight o'clock nine o'clock ten half past ten i don't know how that evening passed it seemed as long as two or three ordinary days many times thinking she heard a sound eyebright flew to the door but only to come back disappointed at last the rain slackened and unable to sit still any longer she put on her waterproof and india rubbers tied a hood over her head and taking a lantern went down to the cliff again it would have been of no use to carry an umbrella in that wind and the night was so dark that even with the help of the lantern and well as she knew the path she continually wandered from it and struck and bruised herself against stumps and branches which there was not light to avoid at last she gained the top of the bank over the beach the sea was perfectly black she could see nothing and hear nothing except the roar of waves and the rattle of the shingle below suddenly came a flash of lightning it lit the water for a minute and revealed a dark spot which might be a boat borne on the waves a little way out from shore eyebright did not hesitate an instant but tumbled and scrambled down the bank at once waving the lantern and crying here i am papa this way papa as loud as she could 
she had scarcely reached the beach when another flash showed the object much nearer next moment came a great tumbling wave and out of the midst of it and of the darkness something plunged onto the beach and then came the lightning again it was a boat and a man in it Eyebright seized and held with all her might oh hurry and get out papa she cried for though she could not see she felt another wave coming i can't keep hold but a minute and then she hardly knew how it happened the man did get out tumble out rather upon the sand and as she let go the boat and caught hold of him in sped the waves but by the she had dreaded with a loud roar splashed her from head to foot and rolled back carrying the boat with it the man lay on the beach as if unable to move but by the sense of touch as well as the dim light of the lantern eyebright already knew that it was not papa but a stranger whose arm she clutched get up oh do get up she screamed you'll be drowned if you don't don't you see that you will oh what shall i do the man seemed to hear for he slowly struggled up to his feet but he did not speak it was terrible work getting him up the cliff the wind in furious moments seemed to seize and pin them down and at such times there was nothing to be done but to stand still flatten themselves against the bank and wait till its force abated eyebright was most thankful when at last they reached the she hurried the stranger with what speed she could across the field to the house keeping the path better than when she came down because the light in the kitchen window now served her as a guide the man stumbled continually and more than once almost fell down as they entered the kitchen he quite fell and lay so long on the floor as to frighten eyebright extremely she had never seen any one faint and she feared the man was dead not knowing in the least what she ought to do she ran for a pillow to lay under his head covered him with a blanket and put some water on his forehead this last was rather unnecessary considering his wet condition but bessie had always brought to the lady jane in that way so eyebright thought it might be the right thing after a long time she had the comfort of seeing him open his eyes oh you are better i am so glad she said do try to get into the rocking chair the floor is so hard here i will help you and she took hold of his arm for the purpose he winced and shrank not that arm don't touch that arm please he said i have hurt it in some way it feels as if it were broken then very slowly and painfully he got up from the floor and into the rocking chair which eyebright had covered with a thick comforter to make it softer she made haste to wet the tea and presently brought him a cup thank you he said faintly you are very kind she could see his face now he was not a young man at all his hair and beard were gray and he seemed as old as papa but he was so wet and pale and wild-looking just then that it was not easy to judge what he was like his voice was pleasant and she did not feel at all afraid of him the tea seemed to revive him a little for after lying quiet a while with his eyes closed he sat up and fumbling with his left hand in an inner pocket produced a flat parcel tied in stout paper with a direction written upon it and beckoning eyebright to him said my dear is it a bad night to ask such a favour in and i don't know how far you may be from the village but could you manage to send this over to the stage office at once it is of great consequence to me or i would not ask it have you a hired man who could go i will pay him handsomely for taking it he must give it to the driver of the stage to put into the express office at gillsworth and take a receipt for it please ask him to be particular about that as the parcel has money in it we haven't any hired man said eyebright i'm so sorry sir but even if we had he couldn't get across for ever so long get across yes this is an island didn't you know that we can walk over to the other shore at low tide but the tide won't be low till after five even if we had a man but there isn't anybody but just me after five and the mail goes out at six muttered the stranger then i must manage to go myself 
he tried to get up but his arm fell helplessly by his side he groaned and sat back again presently to eyebright's terror he began to talk rapidly to himself not to her at all as it seemed it must go he said in a quick excited way i don't mind what i pay or what risk i run do you think i'm going to lose everything lose everything other people's money a long pause then what's a wetting he went on in a loud tone that's nothing a wetting my good name is worth more than money to me he was silent after that for a long time eyebright hoped he had gone to sleep when suddenly he opened his eyes and said imploringly oh if you knew how important it was you would make haste i am sure you would he did not say much more but seemed asleep or unconscious only now and then roused for a moment he muttered some word which showed him to be still thinking about the parcel and the necessity for sending it to the office immediately eyebright put another blanket round him and fetched a chair for his feet to rest upon that seemed all she could do except to sit and watch him getting up occasionally to put wood on the fire or going to the door to listen in hopes of hearing papa's step in the path the parcel lay on the table where the stranger had put it she looked at it and looked at it and then at the clock it was a quarter to five again the broken dreamy voice muttered it must go it must go a sudden generous impulse seized her i'll take it myself she cried then it will be sure to be in time and i can come back when papa does poor child so sure still that papa must come it lacked less than three quarters of an hour to low water at that state of the tide the causeway was usually pretty bare but as she descended the hill eyebright even in the darkness could see that it was not nearly bare now she could hear the swish of the water on the pebbles and by the light of her lantern caught sight of more than one long wave sweeping almost up to the crest of the ridge she would not wait however but set bravely forward the water must be shallow she knew and fast growing more so and she dared not delay for the walk down to the shore in the wind was sure to be a long one i mustn't miss the stage she kept saying to encourage herself and struck in feeling the way with the point of her umbrella and holding the lantern low so as to see where she stepped the water was only two or three inches deep less than that in some places but every few minutes a wave would rush across and bury her feet above the ankles at such times the sand would seem to give way and let her down and a sense of sinking and being carried off would seize upon her and take away all her strength she dared not move at these moments but stood still dug her umbrella into the sand and waited till the water ran back as she got farther from the island a new danger assailed her it was the wind of which she now felt the full force it bent and swayed her about till she felt like a plaything in its grasp once it caught her skirts and blew her over toward the deeper water this was the most dangerous moment of all but she struggled back and the gust relaxed its grasp more than once the fury of the blast was so great that she dared not stand upright but crouched on the wet sand and made herself as flat as possible till it passed by oh how she wished herself back at home again but going back was as dangerous as going forward and she kept on firm in her purpose still though drenched terrified and half crying till little by little wet sand instead of water was under her feet the wave sounded behind instead of immediately beside her and at last stumbling over a clump of blueberry bushes she fell forward on her knees upon the other shore a soggy soaked disagreeable shore enough but a most welcome sight just then so tired and spent was she that for some minutes she lay under the blueberry clump before she could gather strength to pull herself up and go on it was a very hard and painful walk and the wind and the darkness did all they could to keep her back but the gallant little heart did not fail and at last just as the first dim dawn was breaking she gained the village and mr downs's door 
mrs downs had been up nearly all night so great was her anxiety for captain jim and mr bright she had just fallen asleep in her clothes when she was roused by a knock that's them at last she cried jumping up and hurrying to the door great was her surprise at the little soaked figure which met her eyes and greater still when she recognized eyebright why what in the name of why was all she could say at first then regaining her wits eyebright my dear child what has fetched you out at this hour of day and massy's sake how did you come i came on the causeway oh mrs downs is papa here over the causeway cried mrs downs good land alive what possessed you to do such a foolhardy thing i only wonder you were not drowned outright so do i i was almost but mrs downs is papa here or oh, do tell me no they haven't got in yet said mrs downs affecting an ease and security which she did not feel the storm has delayed them or what's more likely they never started at all and will be over to-day i guess that'll turn out to be the way of it jim's got too good sense to put out in the teeth of a heavy squall like this has been and he must have seen it was a comin but my dear how wet you are and what did make you do such a crazy thing as to set out over the causeway in such weather i couldn't help it with a sob there's a poor man up at our house mrs downs he came in a boat and was most drowned and he's hurt his arm dreadfully and i'm afraid he's very sick beside and he wanted this parcel to go by the stage driver he said it must go it was something very important so i brought it the stage hasn't gone yet has it i wanted so much to be in time well i declare said mrs downs furiously he must be a pretty man to send you across the bar in the night and such a storm to fetch his mail i'd like to throw it right straight in the water that i would and serve him right the idea oh he didn't mean that i should go he didn't know anything about it protested eyebright he asked me to send our hired man and when i told him we hadn't any hired man he said that he would come himself but he was too sick he said such queer things that i was frightened and then he went to sleep and i came please tell me what time it is i must go to the office right away indeed you won't said mrs downs you'll come straight upstairs and go to bed i'll wake him up he'll take it there's plenty of time tisn't six yet and the stage will be late this morning i'll bet oh i can't go to bed i must go back to the island eyebright pleaded the man who came is all alone there and you can't think how sick he is poor man or not you'll go to bed said mrs downs inexorably helping the tired child upstairs me and mr downs'll see to the poor man you ain't needed to carry the hull word on your back as long as there's any grown folks left you poor little mite go to bed and sleep and we'll look after your man eyebright was too tired to resist oh please ask mr downs to take a receipt the man was so particular about that was her only protest she fell asleep the moment her head touched the pillow and knew nothing more till afternoon when she opened her eyes feeling for a moment entirely bewildered as to where she was then as it all came back to her mind she jumped up in a hurry her clothes nicely dried lay on a chair beside the bed she hurried them on and ran downstairs nobody was visible except little benny who told her that his mother had gone along up to the island she said you was to eat some breakfast he added it's in the oven a keep him warm shall i show you where it is oh never mind said eyebright never mind about breakfast benny i don't feel hungry ma said you must declared benny opening the oven door and disclosing a plate full of something very dry and black oh dear it's all got burned up i'll drink some milk instead said eyebright who's that coming up the road benny it's pa I guess he's come back to get you said benny running out to meet him mr downs had come to fetch eyebright he looked very grave she thought when she asked eagerly had papa come yet mr downs shook his head perhaps they had stayed over in malachi to avoid the storm he said and will get in later 
he helped eyebright into the boat and rowed to the island without saying another word the wind had abated but the sea was still very rough and long lines of white surf were breaking on the rocks and beaches the kitchen looked very queer and crowded for mr downs had brought down a mattress from upstairs and made a bed on the floor upon which eyebright's man was now sleeping his wet clothes had been changed for some dry ones belonging to mr bright and altogether he looked far less wild and forlorn than he had appeared to be the night before though he evidently was seriously ill mrs downs didn't think his arm was broken but she couldn't be sure and he was sent up the shore to fetch dr treat the natural bone setter there was no regular doctor at scrapplehead the natural bone setter pronounced the arm not broken but badly cut and bruised and the shoulder dislocated he tied it up with a liniment of his own invention but both fever and rheumatism followed and for some days the stranger tossed in pain and delirium mrs downs stayed on the island to nurse him and both she and eyebright had their hands full which was well for it helped them to endure the suspense of the next week as nothing else could have done it was not for some time even after that dreadful week that they gave up the hope that captain jim had waited over in malachi and would appear with the next fair wind then a sloop put in bringing the certain news that he and mr bright had sailed about two hours before the storm began after that the only chance and that a vague one was that the boat might have landed on the coast farther below or blown out to sea being picked up by some passing ship days passed in this hope whenever eyebright could be spared for a moment she always ran to the cliff on the seaside in the hope of seeing a ship sailing in with papa on board or news of him she never spoke as if there was any doubt that he would come in the end and mrs downs dreading to cloud her hopefulness replied always as confidently as she could and tried to be hopeful too so a fortnight passed over the busy anxious household and poor eyebright though her words were still courageous was losing heart and had begun to feel that a cold dreadful wave of sorrow was poising itself a little way off and might presently break all over her when one day as she stood by the bedside of their patient much better now and quite in his senses he looked at her with a sudden start of recognition and said why i know you you are mr bright's little girl are you not you are eyebright why did i not recognize you before don't you recollect me at all don't you know who i am and somehow the words and the pleasant tone of voice and the look which accompanied them made him look different all at once to the child and natural and eyebright did know him it was mr joyce End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of Eyebright by Susan Coolidge This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Recording by Lynn Thompson Chapter 12 Transplanted It is strange that I did not recognize you before said mr. Joyce next day and yet not so strange either for you have grown and altered very much since we met two years and a half ago he might well say so eyebright had altered very much she was as tall as mrs downs now and the fatigue and anxiety of the last fortnight had robbed her of her childish look and made her seem older than she really was any one might have taken her for a girl of seventeen instead of fourteen and a half she and mr joyce had had several long walks during which he learned all about their leaving tunxet about her anxiety for her father and for the first time the full story of the eventful night which had brought him to cozy island he was greatly startled and shocked when he comprehended what danger eyebright had run in doing his errand to the village my dear dear child he said you did me a service i shall never forget i could never have forgiven myself had you lost your life in doing it if I had had my senses about me, I would not have let you go. Pray believe that. That unlucky parcel came near to costing more than it's worth, 
for it was on its account that I set out to row over from Malachi that afternoon. To take the stage? suggested Eyebright. Yes, to catch the stage. The parcel had money in it, and it was of great consequence that it should reach Atterbury, where I live, as soon as possible. You look curious, as if you wanted to hear more. You like stories still, I see. I remember how you begged me to tell you one that night in Tunxet. Yes, I like them dearly, but I hardly ever hear any now. There is no one up here to tell them. Well, this isn't much of a story, or rather it would be a long one enough if I gave the whole of it, but the part which I can tell isn't much. Once upon a time there was a thief, and he stole a quantity of money out of a bank. It was the Atterbury Bank, of which I am the president. The theft came at the worst possible time, and there was great danger, if the money could not be recovered, that the bank would have to stop payment. Fortunately, we got a clue to the thief's whereabouts, and I started in search of him, and caught him in a little village in Canada, where he had hidden himself away, and was feeling quite safe. What makes you look so excited? It is so interesting, said Eyebright. Weren't you a bit afraid when you saw him? Did he have a pistol? Pistol? No. Ah, you are thinking of the thieves in storybooks, I see. Terrible villains with masks and blunderbusses. The kind we have nowadays are quite different. Pretty young men with nice moustaches and curly hair, who are very particular about the fit of their gloves and what kind of cigars they smoke. That's the sort who make off with bank money. This thief of ours was a young fellow, only a few years older than my Charlie, whom I had known all my life, and his father before him. I would a great deal rather have had it one of the old-fashioned kind with a blunderbuss. Well, I found him, and I got back the money, the bulk of it, a part he had spent. Having secured it, my first thought was how to get home quickest, for every day's delay made a great difference to the bank. I had just time to drive over and catch the Portland steamer, but my wagon broke down six miles from Malachi, and when I got in, she had been gone an hour and a half. I made inquiries and found that the Scrapplehead stage started next morning, so I hired a boat and undertook to row across. It was not storming then. The man who let the boat did say that the weather looked kind of uncertain, but I could see no change. It was thick and murky, but it had been that for days back, and I was in such haste to get in that I should probably have tried it, had it looked worse than it did. The distance is not great, and I am used to rowing. Only God's mercy saved me from capsizing when the first squall struck the boat. After that, I have only confused memories. All I could do was to keep the boat head on to the waves, and it was so intensely dark that I could see nothing. I must have been rowing for hours in the blackness, without the least idea where I was or which way I was going, when I saw a light moving toward me. That, from what you say, must have been your lantern. I had just strength left to pull toward it, and the waves carried me onto the beach. My arm was all right then. I must have hurt it when I fell over the side of the boat. It was a miraculous escape, and I believe that I owe my life to the fact of your coming down as you did. I shall never forget that, Eyebright. People often say such things in the warm-heartedness of a great deliverance from danger, or recovery from sickness, and when they get well again, or the danger fades from their minds, they cool off a little. But Mr. Joyce did not cool. He meant all he said, and very soon after came the opportunity of proving his sincerity, for the great wave of trouble which Eyebright had dimly felt and dreaded broke just then and fell upon her. The boat in which Captain Jim Downs and her father had sailed was picked up far down the coast, floating bottom upward, and no doubt remained that both had lost their lives in the storm of that dreadful night. How the poor child could have borne this terrible news without Mr. Joyce at hand to help her, I cannot imagine. She was almost broken-hearted, and grew so thin and pale that it was pitiful to see. Her sorrow was all for papa. She did not realize as yet the loss which had fallen on herself. 
but it would have been hard to find in the world a little girl left in a more desolate position in losing papa she lost everything she had home protection support nobody wanted her she belonged to nobody she could not stay on the island she could not go back to tunxet there was no one in the world unless it was wealthy to whom she had the right to go for help or advice and wealthy herself was a poor woman with little in her power to give except advice eyebright instinctively dreaded the idea of meeting wealthy for she knew that wealthy would think if she did not say it that it was all papa's fault that he ought never to have taken her to maine and the thought of having papa blamed hurt her terribly these anxieties as yet were all swallowed up in grief for papa but whenever she happened to think about herself her mind grew perfectly bewildered and she could not in the least see what she was to do and now what a comfort mr joyce was to her he was nearly well now and in a great hurry to get back to his business but nothing would have induced him to leave the poor child in such trouble and he stayed on and on devoting himself to her all day long soothing her telling her sweet things about heaven and god's goodness and love letting her talk as much as she liked of papa and not trying even to check the crying which such talks always brought on eyebright responded to this kindness with all her warm little heart she learned to love mr joyce dearly and turned to him and clung to him as if he had been a friend always instead of for a few days only but all this time her future remained unsettled and she was at the same time too inexperienced and too much oppressed with sorrow to be able to think about it or make any plans other people were thinking about it however mrs downs talked the matter over with her husband and told mr joyce that he was willing she should take eyebright provided her folks if she had any would consent to have her bound to them till she was of age they never had kept help and she didn't need any now it wasn't for that she wanted the child and as for the binding out twasn't nothing but a formality only mr downs was made that way and he liked to have things done regular and legal he set store by eyebright just as she did herself and they'd see that she had a comfortable home and was well treated in every way mrs downs meant kindly but mr joyce had other schemes for eyebright as soon as the fact of her father's death became certain he had written to his wife and he only waited an answer to propose his plan it came at last and as soon as he had read it he went in search of eyebright who was sitting as she often did now on the bank over the bathing beach looking sorrowfully off toward the sea i have a letter from home he said sitting down beside her and i find that i must go back at once day after tomorrow at latest oh must you said eyebright in a voice which sounded like a sob she hid her face on his arm as she spoke and he knew that she was crying yes but don't cry my dear child i don't mean to leave you here alone that is not my plan at all i want you to come with me long ago i wrote to my wife to propose this plan and i only waited to hear from her before telling you about it will you come and live with us eyebright i can't take your father's place to you nobody could do that and it wouldn't be right they should but we'll all do our best to make you happy and at home and you shall be just like our own girl if you'll come what do you say my dear will you how kind how kind you are replied eyebright in a dazed wondering way i can't think what makes you so good to me dear mr joyce but do you think i ought to come i'm afraid i should be troublesome wealthy used to say that other folks children always were troublesome and that it was mean to settle down on people never mind wealthy or her maxims said mr joyce with a smile we'll risk your being troublesome eyebright will you come do you think papa would have wished to have me asked eyebright wistfully there's nobody for me to ask now except you you know papa always hated being under obligations to people if i stay with mrs downs she added 
timidly i can work and help her and then i shan't be a burden i'm afraid there isn't anything i can do to help if i go with you oh mrs downs has told you of her plan has she said mr joyce half vexed now listen my child i do really and seriously think that your father were he here would prefer that you should go with me if you stay with mrs downs you must give up your education entirely she is a kind woman and really fond of you i think but with her you can have no advantages of any sort and no chance to fit yourself for any higher sort of work than housework with me you will have the opportunity of going to an excellent school and if you do your best by the time you are twenty-one you will be able to teach and support yourself in that way if it becomes necessary and my dear you are mistaken in thinking that there is nothing you can do to help us we never had a daughter but we always have wished for one my wife and i are getting on in life and there are lots of ways in which a young girl will cheer and brighten us up and help to make the house pleasant for charlie it is dull for a boy with no sisters and only an old father and mother so you see we really are in need of a girl and you are just the girl we need so will you come oh i'll come gladly cried eyebright yielding to the pleasantness of the thought i'd rather live with you than anybody else in the world mr joyce if only you are sure it is right it was settled from that moment though eyebright still felt a little qualm of shyness and fear at the thought of the unknown mrs joyce how terrible it will be if she didn't like me when i get there she said to herself only one more day at cozy island and that a very busy and confused one the little house which it had taken so many days to get in order was all pulled to pieces and dismantled in a few hours some things such as papa's desk and eyebright's own special chair mr joyce ordered packed and sent after them to atterbury the rest were left to be sold or perhaps let with the cottage if any one should hire it several articles at his suggestion eyebright gave to mrs downs and she gratified mr downs extremely by making him a present of the boat you couldn't have done nothing to please me better he said it'll come real handy to have another boat and we shall think a heap of its being yours and i'll tell you what we'll just change its name and call it the eyebright after you the first spare day i get i'll paint the name on the stern so we'll always be reminded of you whenever we see it this was quite a flight of fancy for mr downs by sunset the house was cleared of all that was to be taken away and eyebright's trunk packed and locked a very little trunk it was and all it held very old and shabby even mrs downs shook her head and said the things were hardly worth taking but eyebright didn't much mind her head was full of other thoughts and besides she had learned to rely on mr joyce as a helper out of all difficulties and she was content to leave herself and her future once to him so at early dawning of the third day they left the island rowing down to the village in the newly christened eyebright now the property of mr downs the good-byes had been taken the evening before and eyebright did not turn her head as they glided away to look at the green tufted shore or the blue sea bluer than ever in the calm hush of a cloudless sunrise very steadily and carefully she rowed dipping her oars and feathering as papa had taught her as if only intent on doing her task as well as possible for this the last time but later after they reached the village when the farewells had all been spoken the downs family kissed and herself and mr joyce were in the stage wagon ready to start she turned again for one moment and her eyes sought out the blue-green outline which she knew so well there it lay with the calm waters all about it the home which had been at the same time so hard and so pleasant and was now so sad tears rushed to her eyes as she gazed and she whispered to herself so softly that no one else could hear Goodbye, goodbye, papa. How strange and yet how familiar the road seemed, 
the very road over which she and papa had passed less than two years before it was the one journey of her life and she recollected everything perfectly there was the nameless village looking exactly the same but no longer nameless for a wooden board was suspended over the steamboat landing with Pocobasset painted upon it in large letters pretty soon the steamboat came along the same identical steamboat and down the river they went past all the tiny islands and wooded capes which she remembered so well only the light was of sunset now instead of sun rising and the trees which then were tinged with coming spring now bore the red and yellow leaves of autumn there was the good-natured stewardess and the captain nobody was changed nothing had happened as it seemed except to herself they left the boat very early in the morning at a point some fifty miles short of that from which she and papa had embarked and traveling all day reached atterbury late on the second afternoon eyebright had plenty of time to recall her dread of mrs joyce as they drove up from the station the town was large and thriving and looked like a pleasant one there were many white painted green blinded houses with neat courtyards of the kind always to be found in new england villages but among these appeared here and there a quaint old-fashioned mansion and the elm-shaded streets gave glimpses of pretty country beyond woodlands cultivated valley lands and an encircling line of hills with softly rounded outlines eyebright thought it a delightful looking place they drew up before a wide ample house whose garden blazed with late flowers and mr joyce lifting her out hurried up the gravel walk she following timidly threw open the front door and called out loudly mother mother where are you mother at the call a stout little lady in a pink ribboned cap hurried out of a room at one side of the hall oh benjamin is it really you my dear husband well i am glad and she gave him such a kiss then turning to eyebright she said in the kindest voice and this is your little girl is it why benjamin she is taller than i am my dear i am very glad to see you very glad indeed father says you are his girl but you must be mine too and learn to love the old lady just as fast as you can was not this a delightful reception for a weary journey-stained little traveller eyebright returned the kiss with one equally warm and all her fears of mrs joyce fled for ever you shall go right upstairs said this new friend tea will be ready soon and i know you are longing for some cold water to wash off the dust it's the most refreshing thing always after a journey she led the way and left eyebright to herself in a little bedroom such a pretty bedroom it was eyebright felt sure at once that it had been got ready expressly for herself it was just such a room as a young girl fancies with a dainty white bed white curtains at the window a white frilled toilet table and on the toilet table a smart blue pincushion with welcome stuck upon it in shining pins even the books on the table seemed to have been chosen to suit her taste for there lay the dove in eagle's nest the wide wide world the daisy chain in two fat blue volumes and mrs whitney's charming tale of we girls she peeped at one title after another with a little jump of satisfaction how long how very long it was since she had had a new story-book to read a whole feast of enjoyment seemed shut up inside those fascinating covers but she would not nibble the feast now and closing the daisy chain began to unpack her handbag She opened the top bureau drawer and said oh Quite aloud for there appeared to be a row of neat little linen collars and cuffs some pretty black neckties a new bay of fleece white wool and a couple of cunning paper boxes with the jewelers mark on their lids could they be meant for her she ventured to peep one box held a pair of jet sleeve buttons the other a small locket of shining jet with a ribbon drawn through its ring all ready for wear she was still wondering over these discoveries when a little tap sounded on the door 
followed immediately by the appearance of mrs joyce i just came to see if you had all you wanted she said oh you have found those little duds i knew from what father wrote that you couldn't get anything in the place where you were so i chose those few little things and tomorrow we'll see what more you want then cutting short eyebright's thanks she opened the closet door and called out let me have your jacket to hang up my dear there's some shelves at this end for your hats and now i'll help you unpack you'll never begin to feel at home till you're all unpacked and put away nobody does it was a real satisfaction to mrs joyce to notice how few clothes eyebright possessed and how shabby they were all the time that she folded and arranged she was saying to herself gleefully she wants this she needs that she must have all sorts of things at once tomorrow i'll buy her a nice henrietta cloth and a cashmere for every day and a pretty wrap of some kind and a hat she betrayed the direction of her thoughts by turning suddenly with the question what size gloves do you wear my dear i don't know was the reply i haven't had any gloves for two years except a pair of old worsted mittens last year gracious said mrs joyce but i think she was rather pleased than otherwise the truth was all her life long she had been spoiling for a daughter to pet and make much of and now at last her chance had come boys are all very well she told mr joyce that night but once they get into roundabouts there is absolutely nothing more which their mothers can do for them in the way of clothes girls are different i always knew i should like a girl to look after and this seems a dear child benjamin i'm sure i shall be fond of her the tea-bell rang in the midst of the unpacking but as mrs joyce observed they had the rest of the week before them and it didn't matter a bit so she hurried eyebright downstairs and into a cheerful dining-room cheerfulness seemed the main characteristic of the joyce establishment it was not at all an elegant house not even i am sorry to say a tasteful one nothing could possibly be uglier or more commonplace than the furniture the curtains or the flaps of green reps above the curtains known to village circles as lambakins and the pride of mrs joyce's heart the carpets and wallpaper had no affinity with each other and both would have horrified an artist in home decoration but everywhere all through the house were neatness solid comfort and that spirit of family affection which makes any house pleasant no matter how pretty or how ugly it may be and the atmosphere of loving kindness was as reviving to eyebright's drooping spirits as real sunshine is to a real plant drenched and beaten down by heavy storms she felt its warmth through and through and from the first it did her good mr joyce had just asked a blessing and was proceeding to cut the smoking beefsteak before him when the door opened and a tall boy with curly hair and a bright manly face hurried in why father i didn't know you were here or i should have been in long ago how are you sir ending the sentence to eyebright's amazement and amusement both with a hug and a hearty kiss which his father as heartily returned yes i am home again and very glad and thankful to be here said mr joyce here's the new sister charlie you didn't see her did you eyebright this is my son charlie my son charlie like most boys of sixteen was shy with girls whom he was not acquainted with he shook hands cordially but he said little only he watched eyebright when she was not observing and his eyes were very friendly he liked her face and thought her pretty which was certainly very good of him for she was looking her worst tired and pale with none of her usual sparkle and dressed in the waterproof suit which was not at all becoming so here in this secure and kindly haven i think we may leave our little storm-tossed girl with the safe assurance that she will be tenderly and wisely cared for i know that a few among you will want to hear more no story was ever written so long or so conclusive that some child reader did not pop up at the end with oh but just tell us this one thing i cannot satisfy such still for their benefit i will just hint at a remark made by mrs joyce some months later she and mr joyce were sitting on the porch and eyebright who had grown as dear as a daughter to the old lady's heart 
was playing croquet with Charlie It really does seem the luckiest thing that ever was your being shipwrecked on that island She said I was almost frightened to death when I heard about it But if you hadn't we never should have got hold of that child as we did and what a pity that would be she certainly is the nicest girl i ever saw so sweet-tempered and loving and helpful i don't believe any of us could get along without her now how fond she and charlie seem of each other i can't help thinking they'll make a match of it when they grow up it would be an excellent idea don't you agree with me benjamin charlie could never find anybody whom he would like better and we should keep eyebright with us always Mr. Joyce roared with laughter She's only 15 and Charlie won't be 17 till next Saturday. He said don't you think you'd better put off your castles in the air till they are both a little older mother Such castles are absurd still it is by no means impossible that this may come to pass and if it should happen to do so I fancy mr. Joyce will be as much pleased as mother every whit the end End of chapter 12 End of eyebright by Susan Coolidge read by Lynn Thompson in the Willamette Valley